going to go. So once we get some more information on why uh, that was the finding, and if that's something that can be revised, or if we're going to be looking at a more short-term striping project, like was suggested last meeting, that might be how we move forward. So we'll give you an update on that um, in the coming weeks. Um, we have made some progress on our North-South Corridor ITS project. Um, we're scheduling a public outreach meeting for the evening of May 18th at the library community room. That's a Thursday evening. It'll most likely be at 6 p.m. And uh, usually what these meetings entail are, you know, it's an open sort of forum. We have some project conceptual um, diagrams out and we have our staff and our consultants there to answer questions about the project and you know, move it forward uh, so we can complete the environmental, the community um, review, and uh, then we move into the deeper levels of design. Um, the Slow Streets program is moving forward as expected. Uh, we are still on schedule to bring that back next month here to MTech to review the um, residential designs so that we can deploy that. Um, our plan is for June. And uh, we're currently planning the outreach events for the Mission Street uh, design. So um, basically our design team right now is looking at what we completed in 2021, factoring in the ITERIS study, uh, developing the lists of materials that we were not able to purchase in 2021, which is mostly you know things like tape and paint, um, and then uh, coming up with the residential deployment plan. And uh, last couple things, um, we have not had any new traffic impact analyses um, provided to us for the planning commission. However, we have had a, um, we do know that a traffic impact analysis has been initiated for the uh, upcoming um, 625 Fair Oaks Senior Medical Housing Facility. That one, um, is not necessarily following the traditional um, planning commission pathway because of the type of project it is, but we are still going through the process of having the developer uh, do our, um, you know, what is a typical type of traffic study where they do a, 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 v, a low level VMT screening analysis, uh, level of service, uh, queuing and gap analysis. So we're going to be interested to see what that has to say. And then like uh, we've committed to you, uh, we'll have some updates on um, what that looks like once we have uh, a further information. Um, we did hold a community meeting uh, last Thursday night for the um, Huntington Drive uh, 2000 block review. Um, we had the meeting here in the chambers. Um, we had a resident join in person and a few join on Zoom. And uh, that was a discussion between um, uh, the police department and public works and basically a listening session. Um, there was a lot of uh, input from the community, a lot of ideas, um, uh, not just at this area, but the south um, east part of the city in general. There were some conversations about uh, issues along Alhambra and uh, you know Marengo and Fletcher. Um, we did take some comprehensive notes about what we heard in that meeting. Um, we were asked to, as we had mentioned, we've been asked to bring that before you. And I know we discussed this last month. So, you know, we have a couple more work item, work uh, plan related items we want to get through first, but we're planning on maybe bringing some uh, semblance of that item for uh, commission discussion and feedback probably in June is what we're targeting. Uh, and then lastly, um, we haven't been able to approach uh, any of the items that you heard last month about the Diamond Avenue improvements, but we did make um, some small improvements over there. We basically uh, painted the curbs red and made sure all of the no parking, you know, existing no parking prohibitions were, you know, both visible and also being forced. Uh, police also did their part in that respect. Um, and so we did see some improvements over there, but we haven't reached out to the community members yet to see uh, what their thoughts are. Um, so that's the majority of what we have for you tonight. I'm 
uh, open to answer any questions you might have. Any of those items or any items on the list. Thank you, Ted. I'm sure commissioners have questions. Uh, Vice Chair Hughes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A couple of things, Ted. On the Measure M projects, I know we were, were holding off on this uh, study for the signal. Do we know when timing? I know it's not referenced there, but do we have a timing thought for that, for that study? Um, so I, I did mention, want to mention that we did uh, clarify that the other Measure M projects uh, are receiving funding. We just, there was the delay in terms of how our funding agreements were set up. So um, we, uh, we can uh, move forward with executing funding agreements on those and then starting to pursue some of that work, I should mention. And you address my question seeing here that the Pasadena planning had rejected the uh, Columbia striping event, you know, uh, yes, and so that you, you mentioned that um, the sidewalk repairs and ADA ramps updates you've got listed. Do we have a timing for that review at all? Oh, you know, I forgot to mention one of our most significant updates. So um, I had informed the commission that uh, for our construction based projects where we have to go to bid and we basically have a, you know, a uh, very detailed, long bid package that requires us to follow public contracting code and state requirements. Um, we had been working with our city attorney's office to try to update that package for all of Public Works's bid projects. And there is a handful of projects. We have the RRFBs, the uh, CDBG sidewalks, our street improvement packages, um, and then also some other non-transportation projects that we have in public works that we were basically, you know, trying to decide, do we release these bids as they are where some of the, you know, compliance paperwork inside them is years old and it's not really in accordance with current standards or current laws. Um, and, you know, there's a, there's a spectrum of that. Like some are really old, some are you know, only a little bit old. Um, we were going to try to release some of the one of the street packages early, and then uh, our later street package we were going to update with that information. Um, but we actually just received the um, draft uh, updated package today. So this is the te you're talking about. The this is template. the te the template, but we actually we have the um, we have the RFP uh, final plans completed. We have the 2018 um, plans completed for the street package with just you know the specifications that were the issue. Um, and then the, there's a couple others. Uh, so those ones we're gonna roll the, uh, we're gonna basically update the um, bid package with the new template and then post those ones, the RRFBs and the um, 2018 street package. And I'll talk a little bit more about this at the State of Streets next week. Uh, but as far as the CDBG goes, we have uh, one more step to get um, the non-standard ADA ramps along Meridian. We need some. Uh, we need our design consultant to wrap up work so that we can include that in the bid package. So the timing of the CDBG is probably at least another month out before we have the design complete. Um, but we do have the RFP complete. It's just a matter of updating that bid package. Because I wanted to dovetail that into what you shared regarding, and then we'll get to. Um the crossing guards, but some of the mitigation construction elements that the consultant earmarked. Wondering if any of that is packaged in or could be packaged into the plans for the ADA ramps, et cetera. If, there, if there's you know, a cost benefit analysis that it makes sense to, to look at some of those and to roll them in some of the things that we're earmarking to do. Sure. Um, in the current package, it can't because um, that the community development block grant money is dedicated to those sites on Meridian. However, um, tomorrow night when we go to council, we're asking for council to approve our resolution to commit um, next year's sidewalk money. We haven't picked locations yet, but we're asking for them to accept the grant money. And so there's going to be an opportunity for us to you know, commit that next round of funding for fiscal year 23, 24. And that could be something that we do um, you know, at any location. Now, how we're gonna prioritize that is going to come out of what we'll talk about more next week, our streets um, study session, 
because as we do our next um, pavement condition index that we're also going to be asking uh, council to approve next week, uh, we're gonna be doing the concrete aspect of that a little bit differently this year. Um, and so we can provide MTEC um, recommendations about where would be, you know, you can get the most bang for your buck basically in terms of like where sidewalk improvements are. So it could be just basically on a, on a, um, on a anecdotal priority, for example, like we know that we wanna make improvements at Heinton and Marengo, so we put it there, or we could do it based on, um, you know, what comes out of that budgetary analysis out of the PCI uh, process. Just a couple more things. And then um, when you look at the farmer's market and the bollard thing, my question was, it says part of the five-year capital, and I know the plant, there had been the whole consideration of also um, potentially closing off that corridor right there permanently. And just wondering if, again, looking at that aspect, how it dovetails into state, into slow streets for missions. I just don't know. I just want to make sure we don't end up piecemealing stuff and we look at the totality of that whole area and what we're going to be doing and investing it. Sure. So, um, you know, the slow streets project is a little bit interesting because it's not technically a capital improvement project. It's more of like an operational experiment. Um, so none of the things, the things we're doing are infrastructure improvements, but, you know, we did have that evaluation of closing off um, Meridian that was completed in 2021. That was as a part of that slow streets project. So we're having Alta take a look at that now. I seem to recall that there was, you know, might just be common sense, but there was some queuing impacts, some delay impacts based on closing off Meridian. So I don't remember what the recommendation was, and we'll bring that back to you. Um, but yeah, it's not, we, we are absolutely considering um, how these things are going to overlay. I'd say probably one of the larger impacts um, to that, you know, area as far as, you know, uh, a, a closure experiment is we're looking at uh, the gas company possibly having to do some work in that area um, in next year in which we may have to close off part of Meridian um, for them to uh, basically slide a casing underneath the railway. Um, and so that might be, you know, that's all we're, my point here is that like we have a number of things happening in, an, in a location. And so we're, we're not, uh, we're making sure that we're kind of tagging everything in together and being smart about it and sort of like having these projects, you know, sort of come and go without them being synchronized. Right. The yeah. synergy we need to always keep in mind. Absolutely. So two more things. Um, the highway safety, $500,000, it says it's marked on four projects. Can we get the details at some point on the four, specifically the four and how that money allocation is broken down to the 500? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we'll bring that back uh, next month with a little bit more of an update. Um, we'll, we'll have a, one of our uh, staff members who's been out will be back next month as well that can help us with that project. Um, but I, I do know that there was... Uh, I think there was some focus on Fremont Avenue with the location for that project. And then um, last two things kind of related to that is I'm still going to be an advocate for my fellow commissioner on the, t the uh, timing for the gold line signals from the queuing that I know we've been, he's been advocating for, for a long time. Yes, we, we actually we did. Are with that. We actually did reach out to Metro on that one and had a conversation about it. We talked to their, um, I think their operations supervisor and described the situation. Um, he, he told us that there's specifically a delay planned in the programming of when basically when two trains are near the station, because there's like an operational efficiency. They said they gain by not reopening the gates and basically keeping them closed um between two you know trains that happen to be close in proximity i i tried to explain the issue a little bit further what we really came down to was they asked if you could if we could give them the actual specific you know time stamps that it happens they'll pull their logs and take a look and see what the programming issue is so that's how far we got so we actually just need someone to 
sit there for a little bit and uh, get us like a time stamp on when that 28 second issue occurs. Then a promise last one was um, any more action with the, with the Holy Family High School queuing with Ramona and the situation? Because I know there had been a discussion, there had been a community meeting, and then it was being analyzed, looked at, experienced what? Yeah, our plan for some time now has been that that item most likely has to go back to the um, the planning commission for review because of its um, because of uh, how the specific plan of that area is set up and how the current configuration may be in conflict with that plan. So the idea was that you know using the the information the commission had worked on and what we had gained from the previous study from I think it was 2020 um, supporting Holy Family and going back to the Planning Commission to sort of offer a reconfiguration of their drop-off um, setup. So that's our, we've been working, talking to planning about how to go about doing that, but it's just something we haven't been able to get through just because of our volume. But that's our plan. I guess the only thought is that you know we've got what two more months or so of school, then we'd have summer, so that if anything had to be restriped, reconfigured, resigned in preparation for the start of the next school year, it would be you know you could do some of those activities through the summer. Yes. Yeah, that's a possibility. Thanks, Ted. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Vice Chair Hughes, um, Commissioner Averson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening, Ted. I have a, a few items I want to go over. A couple of them are crossovers with, with uh, Commissioner Hughes, but different aspects. So uh, street improvements, you refer to two to three projects. Are there a number of streets within each project, or is that two to three streets? There's a number of streets within the project, so I can clarify. Okay. So. What we have is we have a 2018-2019 package um, that was designed by KOA. Um, we have a 2019-2020 package, which is under design with RKA. Um, we have a, we're, we're bisecting part of that package, or at least our, that's what our plan is with RKA. That's the Mission Pasadena Arroyo part of it. So that the route, more routine street work on the multiple streets can move forward and the more complicated sort of reconfiguration project can be done separately. Um, there's also uh, the 2019 2020 package, and I'm, I'm going to be repeating myself. I may say the same, same, same thing next week, but I'll I offer don't want it here. You to yeah. dive too deep. I was just wanting to make sure, sure. when we say two to three projects, that does not. Yeah. Matter. And then the fourth one is also the Cape Slurry Seal project, which is multiple streets also. So um, there's different issues with each um, package, but basically we think we can move forward with two of them. Uh, where our plan is to do it before then, at least the 2018 restructuring package before the end of the fiscal year will be out and bid before uh, the end of June. Um, the the uh, Cape Slurry project was envisioned as an asphalt, I'm sorry, a asphalt rubber project, but given the costing for that, and you know, we don't really get a lot of grant support for that type of work, we're reconsidering the materials and then still bidding that same project with the same streets. Um, so hopefully we can get that one done next. And then the 2019 project that's split up will follow because for the 2019 project, what we are weren't able to do on the 2018 project was actually include all the utility improvements that need to be done. The 2019 project um, actually um, covers areas of the city where we've had water breaks and we hadn't, the package doesn't include those utility improvements. So we really just make, think it's um, you know prudent to add water lines and sewer lines into that package. So that's why that would come a little later. Okay. Yeah. But yeah. all this year, this calendar year. Okay. And, and we, did we have a 2021 list or a 21-22 list at all? 
Well, so know it's there interesting was one year that was skipped. Yeah, COVID. Our SB one list is off one year than the name of the projects. So you, we had a twenty twenty, um, we had a twenty twenty one list, um, but I think it, it might be the 2019, 2020 list, and then our twenty one twenty two list was just basically we didn't budget enough money under the twenty twenty one list, so it's the same list. So. Um, so the two years that were skipped? To no, it was, it was, one. I think it was just one year that was skipped, but it looks like two when you okay. lay it out. Um, so Ted, for clarification, sure. I'm looking at a list from 2019, the 2019, 2020, and then the 2020, and the 20, and the, these, this is what you're referring to, right? Well, this, this there's more, there's, there's more to the story. The semblance of, of some of them. Yeah, but the, the SB1 lists don't match the bid packages either. That's another issue. There's streets that are not included. There's extra streets that are in there. It's a little confusing and problematic for us. Bottom line is the ones that are committed in the package we're going to build. And then we'll talk about this more next week. We need to, recon we need to reconsider how we're doing this. Uh, and it's not, a, it's not something that we do every year, almost like we're doing it for the first time. It's got to be a, long, you know, a longer term plan that we have these projects ready to go. And then when we get the money, Funded in July, we just we build um, instead of starting the process in July when we pick okay. the streets. And I know, stay tuned because we'll go much deeper next week, right? We will. Yes. Thank Probably you. Probably more you, more you deep than we're all comfortable with. My fear when yes. I saw two to three. Yeah. I okay. Um, next one, Measure M. Uh, Mr. Hughes asked a question about the proposed signal. I think, and I don't think I heard an answer to that. The she oh. was asking about. The study regarding Monterey mission. Gotcha. The the project Monterey that we don't have on Perfect. Measure M. Yes. Yeah. Um, we have not moved forward with that warrant analysis yet, but I understand what you're saying now. So yes, that is still a priority for us, uh, even though it's not on our okay. approved project list. Okay. Um, when you say not approved, you mean it's not this on latest round from the yeah it's not part of a funding agreement but okay. even though it's been submitted we've approved it council's approved it jbcpa approved it some time ago yes and metro says right. do your feasibility work right. and then we'll okay. well, then we'll talk if it can show up somewhere um that would be great yeah what we'll do is we'll split out um we can, we're going to split out these measure m project requests into their own projects now okay. And then we'll we'll have five different items again because you're list. doing a fantastic job of keeping track of everything. So I just want to make sure. sure. Okay. Um, and I'm not going one by one, even though it feels like that. The the next one, the Columbia Street. If if I I know you're gonna you're following up. I I would love to hear next month what the issues are, and if these look like they're short term, not sol not solvable or insoluble. If if we can look more at those short-term improvements at the Columbia, Fremont, Pasadena intersection. Absolutely, that's our plan. Okay, fantastic. Um, skipping a couple pages. Okay, slow streets, a couple clarification questions. The 2021 traffic study you say that we're gonna look at, I guess next month, that's ITERIS. Does that sound right? Yes, but let me clarify. We won't be ready to look at that next oh. month. We'll look, we look at the residential streets next month. Uh, the ITERA study focused on the mission uh, model. So we're going to look at the, uh, this. Oh, I'm the, sorry. Yeah. Okay. So you're saying the work on the mission street design is commencing with a review of it, but that's not by us yet because we've never seen it. Just so you know. Exactly. So okay. we want to, the a consultant hasn't seen it. Our consultant hasn't seen it either. It was done. Okay. Uh, it was finished right at the end of the, like literally on New Year's Eve. And uh, we couldn't give it to the other consultant to look at. So, okay. All yeah. right. But it's just, that's the study we're exactly. talking about. Yeah. And then um, a review of the residential street section is planned for our next meeting. Will that include updates, changes, revisions from our meeting back in December 2021? Yes. Okay. Now um, we'll have to, we'll be talking about those because we have basically revisited those comments, um, and you know from. Alta's team is taking a look at what they feel is feasible. So we're trying to facilitate them taking a look at all of the comments that we had. Um, but that's what we're bringing back to discuss okay. that. Great, great. And uh, at the bottom of that page, the Ramona uh, item, for lack of a better word. In there, you talk about, and I forgot to ask, that's months, my fault. 
City staff discussed the improvements at the uh, SPUSD City Ad Hoc Committee in late February 2023. What, in a nutshell, was there any result of that discussion or it was just discussed? These are the, the propos proposals, I guess, we've made for the area around the high school and Holy Family. Yes. Um, I just wasn't sure where. We have a, a draft uh, outreach document that we're supposed to be providing to the school district. Um, and they will provide it to their parents and students. Um, and then we move forward with what we discussed. Okay. Fair enough. Thank you very much. Uh, so I think just one or two more things. You explained, I was going to ask you about the traffic impact analyses item on page seven. You explained that. Um, I know the answer to this question. I might ask it anyway. So the traffic study that you, re you referenced, uh, two questions. One, is there going to be an opportunity for the commission as a whole to review it? There will not. And okay. then there's more to that. No commission will be able to review it. Fantastic. Okay. And, and then, and I'm being facetious for the record. Um, when that, when will there be an opportunity to review the traffic study, if not as a member of this commission, as a member of the public? In other words, when, since we're not going to see it formally, I know I, for one, would certainly like to see it when it's available for public review. And I, that happens at some point. I just don't know when that is. You may not have a date, but I just want to plant the seed because it is important. And even if we're not going to look at it and apparently planning commission won't either i'm assuming it's something that's going to go to council or is that not even happening no um oh. that project at the moment is uh by right they just yeah i think it's like a, min a ministerial process okay. so um it's a really good question i don't have an answer but i get one because i'm sure there'll be many people who ask that question so, so it'd so be a matter of like when will the when will the study be publicly available basically is the question yes, and I, yeah i know i for one would like to see it so if there's a way to know when that's coming or when that might be available that'd be great of course yeah with that is that also will include the seven year required speed study that's a separate um effort and yet it's something that we have to initiate also because we're coming up on that time um but that'll be a separate initiative that's yeah, a citywide initiative they have to be separate well one is developer funded and then one is cindy city funded and they have different scopes so and last but not least, real quick, Diamond Avenue. You mentioned red curb. So I just want to be clear. You re, you didn't add any red curb. You just refreshed existing. Okay. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Okay. We tried to, you know, make some sort of improvements um, without having a, an evaluation of what can be done further. Just, uh, you know, what we could do to respond. Uh, and between that and the enforcement, um, I'm not saying that it solved the problem, but we have had positive feedback about it. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And past Chair Fisher. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Ted, I have uh, two questions. One concerns the, uh, I think, the earlier question about uh, Mission Meridian and the timing there. As you indicated, we met there and looked at some of the uh, timing improvements that could be made. Um, you mentioned that uh, you talked to Metro. And they indicated, and I want to make sure I have this straight, that uh, that 28 all red time uh, is necessary to allow efficiency for the northbound when there's a preemption uh, that has just occurred for one of the directions and the upcoming other direction? Or are they uh, looking into the 28 seconds? Um, so understanding that there's, um, we had talked about multiple things that could be done. Just identifying the one issue of the, you know, that uh, periodic delay that seems excessive. Um, I, you know, I had talked to the uh, supervisor about it, and without having the specific details, I described what was being, what the experience was that we were seeing, and he said, in some cases, it's programmed in such a way that um, when you have the two train circumstance. Um, and the system identifies that there will be a very small um, opening between the two trains. It'll just keep this. It'll keep the gate system closed, basically, is what he indicated. But he said, I, "But I said, you know, I, I think there's more to it." 
And he said, well, we can look actually at the data if you can, you know, if you can identify, you know, because we were talking generally about what happens and it was hard to actually, you know, observe it at the time. Um, so he said, if you actually give us like some timestamp data, like when you're seeing this, we'll pull that information to see what happened and see if it's what they think they're, what they had mentioned to us, which is what their initial impression was, or if there is some other um, issue there. Okay, well, I think they have a good general answer, but I think when, when you have the time to identify when these 28 second all red periods occur, I think when they look into it, they'll see room for improvement. I, I can certainly understand a 15 second all red because you don't wanna go into a new phase and yellow and all red only to have a seven second green or whatever, but 28 seconds. Seems uh, excessive. It does seem excessive uh, to me. Also want to, just to make sure that um, that we are looking at the other improvements that were suggested there, such as the leading pedestrian interval. I feel that it would be helpful there because you have right turns that cannot see the peds associated with that turn due to the setback of the crosswalks. And also the um, exclusive crosswalk interval when train preemptions occur. As, as we saw, almost everyone is walking across the street when, there's, when the gates are going down. And it's perfectly safe to do so, but the pedestrian heads say don't walk, and we really want to make sure we have reasonable controls out there. So that was just a reminder. Um, let me see. I had a question on the slow streets. Um, in discussions and in reading in the newspaper and such, it's always implied that um, for the uh, Mission Street uh, project that there may be uh, a, a lane takeaway, a reduction in lanes. And in prior meetings, we've discussed uh, the need to make sure that if we have a reduction in lanes at the second most uh, congested location in the city, that we also accompany it by some sort of mitigation measure. And I just want to see if that's still the case. Um, yeah, I mean, that was the, that was the, in, uh, I think that was the intent behind doing the iTerris work was to model it and then identify what could be done versus, um, you know, the design alone, um, which is, you know, largely informed by, you know, a safe configuration, but also creating space for parklets and diagonal parking. So I, yeah, that, I, I believe that's the intent is uh, you know util utilizing that information um, based on the modeling to determine if there's something that can be added uh, to mitigate um, you know uh, is, like queuing, for example. So I don't exactly know what that's going to be, um, but I you know that's why I think that's why the scope is prepared the way it is. Okay, but will that be part of the study to? provide that change to Mission Street, or will that be a separate later study? I, I believe it's in our scope as it is. Okay. Yeah, because uh, we added um, iTerris back in as a sub-consultant for this new round um, to test out several configurations in that way. So I think that's the, the, that's the plan. Okay, pleased to hear that, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Fisher. Um, and Ted, I, I just have a couple of comments um, or questions, um, particularly with the, um, there are several timing improvements and even you know this afternoon or this evening, we might discuss another intersection and have another recommendation for another timing improvement and, and another signal. Um, aside for the kind of Mission Meridian one, like what's, what's really the barrier to getting those out in the field? Um, not getting into into the weeds too much. Is it not having delegated authority to go to a consultant and to have them do it or in-house staff? It's really the in-house staff. Yeah. You know, we've uh, traditionally handled um, traffic signals through the um, super the facility staff, and we don't have that staff right now. Um, we're hoping that that gets resolved in the next couple of months. Um, it's a uh, 
it's an it's an issue with the um, employees association that we're trying to resolve. Mm -hmm. um, and so where we do have some like um, the, the union is that the union? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Where we do have some capacity to, you know, utilize contracted staff or even some of our other staff, we've had to focus on actual facility issues. We just brought a crane in across the street or uh, back here to last week to replace the furnace. I don't know if you've been to City Hall lately, but you saw there's mm -hmm. some temporary um, heating all through the system. So we just don't have the facilities capacity to get it done. Um, in these particular cases, we did. We do have a consultant who's working on it. They needed additional documentation. Mm -hmm. um, we couldn't find it. We didn't have the staff available to go search for it. So it's just it's just a slow yeah. go, basically. Okay. Until we can get a little bit more help. Yeah. Yeah. No, I appreciate that. I think some of those are just um, improvements, like even finding a key. They're they're improvements. A, they're issue. improvements that could be done like pretty easily because most of them don't require new infrastructure and you know with timing adjustments you know the project timeline on those sometimes can be a day if you have all the information yeah. you know you can do the timing chart in a day and have it have it implemented so i, I was just kind of curious we had some know. missing timing sheet information missing um plans that showed the um configuration wow. of the the c you know the cpu unit mm -hmm. um we were trying to locate a key. I mean, it's really sort of stuff that's right. a little frustrating. Yeah. So um, the barrier seems more internal processes. Exactly. Than, yeah. You know, the actual work itself. Yeah. In fact, uh, in some cases, it's it can be the consultant waiting on us to try to figure out what to do so they can finish up the work. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Appreciate that. And thank you. And thank you for this update. And as well as I'm sure um, your staff helped provide all the information for these projects. Um, I think it's a certainly value to me and as well as us. And it's a really transparent look. I think it's like everything that's going on as far as transportation goes at Public Works. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. With that, I guess the order will be we'll receive and file it. Um, our next item um, is um, an evaluation of a second crossing guard on Huntington Drive and Marengo Avenue. Um, I will turn it over to staff. I believe um, there's a presentation or a discussion. No, just a, dis uh, just a discussion, no presentation. Right, thank you. Um, so uh, good evening, um, Chair Dunlap and Commissioners. My name is David Pena. I'm the Transportation Program Manager. Um, it's my first meeting here, and I'm excited to be here to uh, present this uh, first item. Got an opportunity um, to review the study and also work uh, on the staff report. So I'm just going to give you a synopsis and some background on it and present this item to you guys. Um, so this item on the agenda is um, the request to maintain a, a second crossing guard at Huntington and Marengo, and we're presenting this item to the commission um, to the commissioners today to receive input, so we can further give a recommendation to uh, to council on next action. So just to give you some background on this um, on this item, a special council meeting was held um, last year on July twenty um, twenty second, twenty twenty two to address our residents' concerns, um, to have a second crossing guard at Marengo and Huntington. Um, at the time, the council approved um, the second crossing guard for a year for that school year, uh, with the school year coming to an end um, in June. It's up for consider um, consideration whether we're gonna maintain that crossing guard at that location. So at the same time, council directed us to uh, study further the evaluation of the need for the uh, crossing guard at that location. Um, so we procured the services of Minigar and Associates, and they did an analysis of, um, of this item. Um, so they reviewed all the public comments that were um, submitted to council at the time, and some of the uh, reoccurring themes that they um, found out from the um, public comments were uh, speeding violations, limited uh, pedestrian, um, Limited uh, pedestrian visibility due to vehicles parked along Huntington um, Drive on the east and then on the west side. Also violations of uh, red lights while turning from each direction. And also making right turns without yielding to um, um, pedestrians. Um, so part of the consultant's um, uh, research included uh, collecting collision data. Um, they gathered that information from, um, um, from Switters and as well as uh, from Tim. So, they did a five-year analysis from 2017 to 2021, 
and identify that 649 collisions occurred in the city of South Pasadena at the time um, in that five-year period um, near Hunt um, and, and the city. However, they identify that six of those collisions occurred near the school and during the time that um, school was um, um, starting or was in session. So specifically two um, collisions involved a, a pedestrian or a cyclist, while the other four um, collisions involve uh, motorists versus motorists. Um, they also conducted a traffic count at the same time. So then um, part of that analysis um, involved making recommendations. Um, um, so the consultant made uh, a list of 10 recommendations. Some of them were to address the um, um, the speed reduction treatments and as well as visibility measures. So um, as part of the study, if you guys do have it available um, in the recommendation sections, um, the, the first one that they do recommend was prohibiting right turns for vehicles uh, during red lines. So that means uh, traveling westbound um, on the northeast corner. Um, they were recommending putting some type of signage at that location at the um, uh, northeast corner where no right turns during specific times for the school. Um, another recommendation they made was implementing a protected left turn signal on Marengo Avenue uh, to reduce the conflict between uh, pedestrians and on, on motorists while they're making a left turn along Marengo. I'm um, going southbound and also I'm um, going northbound. Another recommendation was installing a pedestrian countdown signal um, head uh, to reduce pedestrian collision, um, collisions and make uh, pedestrians aware of the time as well, of how much time they have to cross. Um, also modifying signal timing for Huntington Drive, uh, reducing the duration of the green light eastbound and westbound for motorists, um, and also increasing law enforcement present um, to um, during peak hours just to enforce uh, the vehicle code at that time. And some of the other visibility measures that they uh, recommended were the, um, the elimination of the Huntington Drive crosswalk on the west side approach. Um, this was to increase visibility and um, move all the pedestrians to one side of the street and make it more visible for motorists while they're um, crossing that path. Um, also, um, the installation of, any, uh, of a race crosswalk on Marengo Avenue. Um, that's obviously to increase visibility for uh, pedestrians when they're crossing the street on Marengo. Um, they also noticed that there was um, landscape on the center median uh, that was overgrown, and they recommended uh, trimming some of that um, some of that landscape on the center median on Huntington. Um, also, they noticed that there was uh, on the northeast corner uh, a signal controller box that may obscure. Um, the view of some motorists when uh, pedestrians are, um, are crossing, so they recommended to potentially relocate um, that specific controller box. And then the, uh, one of the other recommendations they made was uh, signal facing to include um, leading pedestrian intervals for pedestrian um, to allow the pedestrians to enter the, uh, um, the intersection with a three to seven second um, lead time prior to uh, motorists moving ahead on their turn to move ahead. Um, so the final recommendations that uh, Minigar and Associates made overall was um, that at this location, based on the um, traffic counts, based on the, uh, the built environment and built on, on their assessment, um, what they are not recommending is to maintain a second crossing car at that location. What they recommended is to adopt some of these um, um, speed uh, measures Speed, uh, speed reduction treatments, as well as visibility um, measures, either in a singular fashion or in combination to address the core issues that some of the residents have brought up. Um, so that was um, um, the analysis of the, um, of the study. So I'll open it up for questions if anybody has any questions. Great, thank you, David, and welcome to South Pasadena. It's nice thank to you. meet you and we appreciate your inaugural presentation to the commission or to many more. Um, Liana, do we have any public um, in-person or Zoom public comment on this item? All right, since we just have one, maybe let's proceed with public comment. Uh, 
Hi, this is Ella Husagan. Are you just taking public comment as people unmute themselves or? Ella, I can hear you. This is Alexis Altunian, but I'm not hearing anything else. Okay. Um, you may proceed with public comment. If you could state your name and if you feel comfortable, you can state what street you live on. So who do we have first, Liana? All right, Alexis, can you go ahead? For, go ahead. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I'm Alexis Altunian. I'm a resident lifelong of South Pasadena and I'm on Hunting, uh, South Maringo, just south of Huntington Drive. So good evening, everyone. I don't know if this is just a two minute uh, comment period, but I wanted to share um, what I shared with the commission um, back last summer when the study was initiated. As I've lived on Marengo um, as a child, I grew up here, my parents moved here, um, and now I'm raising my daughter here. We walk to Marengo um, every morning for school, especially when it's not raining. <laughs> and we have been concerned for quite some time about crossing Huntington Drive um, and getting to Marengo safely. When I was, I'd say early 2000s, I was driving home one afternoon. Um, I had known that crossing guard very well who was stationed on the, I guess, the Eastern side of Huntington Drive. Uh, she was struck. This was probably 2003, 2004 thereabouts. And it was a family friend. Uh, I went to school with her children and that really left a lasting impact. It was about 3 p.m. in the afternoon. Um, prior to having a child of my own that I'm walking to school every day, I was already hyper aware of that type of situation. Not to mention whenever I walk or run, there's always a, a car that turns right into you know the pedestrian crosswalk and is not really paying attention. And while I appreciate the measures and the study that was conducted, I'd really appreciate having the second guard because I think having them work in tandem really helps in the morning and it makes the area more visible. And I think that's just what we're all concerned about is too many close calls um, and it's such a busy street. So anything that can be done, any resources that can be um, allocated would be greatly appreciated so we can continue to walk to school safely, which is why we love this town why I chose to raise my family here um, and why my parents moved here, you know, 40 years ago. Thank you very much. Thank you. Liana, who's next? Ella, you may proceed with your comment. Thank you so much. And I think that um, Ava Bonner Romero, who's also here, would like to make public comment, but I don't see her hand raised. So just letting you know. Um, I live on La France Avenue and I walk my kids to Marengo most days. Um, I actually got concerned about that. Well, I had been concerned. And then I started raising the issue last year because my husband almost got hit by a car taking a left um, from Marengo onto westbound Huntington, um, wasn't paying attention and just, you know, went sailed right through. Um, earlier this year, I was meeting my daughter at the intersection. She was on the east side of um the northeast corner and I was on the um, northwest corner and sh the light turned green. She started to walk and a car taking a right onto northbound Marengo started to pull into the intersection right in front of her to take the right without paying attention. And luckily the crossing guard was there and she saw the crossing guard. She stopped and she waited, but it was a horrifying moment. So there, you know, and that I could go on and on. I mean, I've seen, uh, just, you know, tons and tons of really close calls at this intersection. It, you know, people are traveling very fast. They are not looking out for pedestrians and the crossing guards really, really do help um, to at least, you know, make, make pedestrians and drivers more aware of the of the conditions. Um, I think the infrastructure changes are also necessary, but you know, until they are like implemented, there's no reason to pull the crossing guards. It it's it's a hazard. Um, I don't think it makes sense to pull the crosswalk on the west side of the street when you have, you know, 54 people crossing. I don't think that seems like low volume to me. That seems like something that is good and positive and we want to encourage. Um, and I think when you take away a crosswalk at a major intersection, especially where there was one before, it just contributes to confusion and among motorists and pedestrians 
And, you know, you have kids who are going to the middle school who are very naturally want, going to want to be on the West side of Marengo anyway. So, you know, and sometimes they're staring at their phones. So I, I just think everything you can do to make this intersection safer, it, you know, will be welcome to this community that lives in the area and has to cross the street every day. I know one mom who has totally stopped walking her kids to school. She drives them north of Huntington and then drops them off because she's totally freaked out. It, you know, it's just really a, is a big problem. Um, the parking is way too close to the intersection. The visibility is really poor. I don't know why that's not in the consultant's report. Um, but, you know, even though it was something we raised a year ago, I don't know why scramble crossing is not in the report when we specifically asked for that. And the city said, yes, that's something the consultant can look at. There are already um, timers on the, the pedestrian crosswalk um, lights. So that that's not something that could be um, added to be more helpful. So that's, I have lots to say, but that, I'll stop there. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you. You may proceed, Ava. Um, hello, could you hear me? Um, yes, we can. Yes, okay. So uh, yes, my name is Eva Romero. I also uh, live in the South part of South Pasadena, uh, South Huntington. And we also walk every day to school and um, totally agree to, with the previous participants. Uh, that crossing is, um, it, it's just a mess. It's, it's a big problem. Um, I was also almost hit by a truck once when I was trying to volunteer at a school. Uh, it was really, really close, like 10 inches. And I knew it was uh, something bad when I um, raised my face, um, my, yeah, my face and I saw uh, the driver's face. So when I saw his face, he was like saying, I almost hit you. I mean, it was so, so close. Uh, so, and I was totally aware of that crossing. I was um, seeing the truck. It's not that I was doing something else. I was seeing the truck coming, but it was my right to cross. So that that was really, really um, scary. Uh, the problem in that intersection is that when you drive and we all drive past in any direction, um, you do not see pedestrians and that's that's a big, big problem. Um, so I totally think it's the the keeping the two crossing guards, it's helping a lot um, because there are a lot of kids um, crossing um, two, four times a day uh, because you need to go to school and return, middle schoolers and high schoolers. So um, I think, the, those crossing guards are helping us a lot. And while the other measures may be um, really um, helpful too, in the meantime, um, I think it, it, it's not such a, it's, it's a cost efficient um, solution and those Thank guards you. are really helping us. Thank you. Thanks. Liana, is that everyone? All right, that'll end public comment. Um, I, I know I have a number of questions as well as um, probably my fellow commissioners. Um, I forget, what's the best, do we wanna say five minutes each and we'll just go down the line and um, should I start, start to my left, um, Commissioner Fisher? Kick us off with questions. Sure. People do questions and then we can come back around and do discussion and okay. comments. Thank you and welcome David Pena. Thank you. Look, look, we all look forward to working with you. Um, I saw, a number of recommendations from the consultant, but I didn't see the data that supports those recommendations. Uh, not that I, I couldn't support it, but I just didn't see it. For example, um, he has to reduce risk from speeding and turning, have a westbound no right turn on red sign. But when I go to the data, it shows uh, during the PM peak, which is the heaviest time period, there's um, 30, let, let me get the right number. Sorry about that. Yeah, during the morning peak, 
there's 61 westbound right turns. That's about one a minute and 30 pedestrians, one every two minutes. So I'm just, I didn't see the information or the explanation or the data there to support that recommendation. Certainly, I think there are uh, reasons for having no right turn on red, especially if you have uh, documented interference or drivers get a little assertive or there's a sight distance issue, but I just didn't see the data. So I think, you know, I said at a prior uh, commission meeting that I like to follow the doctor patient prescription process where the public says there's something wrong here. It's like someone going to the doctor and say, I got an ache. And then uh, when the patient goes to the doctor, it's up to the doctor to get the lab data. So now that's parallel, that's uh, similar to the consultant uh, getting uh, field data and documenting things and, and, and such. And then the prescription is you've documented the problem with the patient. Uh, you've got data to support it and you give a prescription for the patient. Likewise, uh, you hire the traffic consultant, he collects data, and then he has uh, recommendations that follow that data. So I just didn't see that. Um, I do think there are a number of improvements that could be made there. And I didn't know if you wanted to do that during the first round or possibly a second round. So what do you think? Um, yeah, let's do, let's do the okay. question first, and then we can talk about okay. improvements. So, okay, I'd, I'd like to see, uh, again, more documenting data for this. Um, my primary question was, this commission was not involved in the placement of the first crossing guard. What was the problem that resulted in the placement of the first crossing guard at the location? Ted, do we have any uh, historical context on? Um, yeah, unfortunately, I don't think we have the context on that. We, um, I think during the council discussion, it was identified that there are crossing guards at a number of locations in the city that had been established at some point. Um, and so there was, as you heard tonight, it was basically a community request that a second crossing guard get added here. So I don't know, I don't think we have much on how the original crossing guard was established. Um, but, you know, I'll, I'll add, and I'm sure David was going to say this, that, uh, you know, one of the reasons we brought the report here was to hear, obviously, the community input um, and your input. But um, certainly, if there's things that might be, uh, you know, that were missed in terms of the analysis, which is one of the reasons we want to, you know, sunlight this type of question, uh, we can go back and ask that. So as far as uh, finding out about the original cross card, we can engage uh, PD a police department about that and then obviously you know any things that were not in the study that's the kind of feedback we're looking for tonight also that we can uh, re revisit but uh, we can we can probably um get that information for you okay and, and was there a uh, i think you indicated that the uh, second crossing guard was added what last uh, october uh, last august or something yeah, it was in the fall uh, okay. community request. And as David mentioned, um, council approved it for the school year and asked Public Works to do the evaluation and bring it to MTEC and then back to the council. And at the time that it was approved, it hadn't come before this commission. So does anyone know what the defined problem was at that time? Um, that, that led to the deployment of the second crossing guard. It was mostly um, some of the comments that, so the the written public comments that you see that were included in the um, study were the comments that triggered the second, the council adding the second count, uh, crossing guard. So it was, it, there wasn't, um, my understanding was it's completely a, a community request. Um, we, I don't think there was a, um, what, not that, uh, not that it's not warranted, but I don't think that the um, request was initiated by any sort of study or evaluation by Public Works. Okay, thank you. And then my final question for right now is, how many crossing guards are there in the city? 
Also a question. I want to, I'm going to guess here. I feel like there's a, a I want to say there's a dozen, but I'm really not sure. I was discussed that evening um, last fall. I think that was around the number, but I'm not sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Fisher. And we'll have more time for questions. Um, Commissioner Abelson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm going to start my questions with an answer. <laughs> I, I believe there are 11, but maybe 12 with, with this second crossing guard. And I believe of them, most of them are serving Marengo. Um, so the first question is, and forgive my naivete. So it, we keep talking about a second crossing guard. That means there already was a first at the yes. same intersection, just to be clear. Yes. 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 And so the study talks about, I guess, the second crossing guard or a crossing guard covering the east and the southern crosswalks. I believe. Correct. So what does the other crossing guard do? I'm not quite understanding the interplay between the first and the second. So there are two at that location. Yes. What's the difference between what one does versus the others? One on one side and one the other or? Yes, there's one on the other side, one on the south side and one on the north side on opposite corners. Okay. So when they cross as the, um, as they get the green line, then they start crossing and they meet in the middle and then they go back to their original location. Okay. So one's covering the west leg and one's covering the east yes. leg. Okay. Um, thank you for that. I didn't see in the report uh, any speed data. Was any collected? It's all it 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 it's it, it's all volumes, right? Uh, vehicular pedestrian Correct. and Correct. It was just volumes that okay. they collected. So no speed data here. No. Okay. And then I noticed looking at the report, I, I was sort of having the same challenge that Commissioner Fisher was. I was looking, I saw the list of recommendations to reduce various risks, but I wasn't seeing, looking at pages seven and eight, I wasn't seeing anything in terms of a, a problem being identified. The closest I came was on page eight, the second full paragraph, it, it talks about southbound vehicles turning left from Marengo to Huntington can get impatient and increased risk to pedestrians who are in that, I guess, that East Lake crosswalk. I mean, that's the closest I came. So I was just wondering, is there some identification of an existing problem in this report other than what I just saw there? Did you see anything? Um, no, just based on the, uh, the public comments that you know, was received from, from the community that they identified just reoccurring themes of what they were seeing out there, and which then trigger the special counsel meeting for that. Okay. And am I right? I just saw one in the five years, there was one accident that involved a pedestrian. Does that sound right? Correct. At that um, location okay. during that time. Okay. That maybe it just give me a moment. And by the way, welcome. <laughs> I didn't Thank you. Just start peppering you with questions. <laughs> That's all right. But we're very glad to have you here. We really appreciate it. Thank you. I think that was it for questions. Yeah, I just have. I noticed the report is marked draft. Uh, is that? Do the fact that you're coming to us for input and then you're going to go back to the consultant or to something else? Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, you know, seeing as we're preparing to bring this item to council, we're both looking at your recommendation and we fully expected that perhaps that recommendation might be additional information is needed, you know, reevaluate this. And so it's a, it's a draft report. Okay, great. I think those are my questions for now. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Abelson. Um, Commissioner Hughes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Vice Chair Hughes, my bad. <laughs> Welcome, so happy to have you. You have no idea how excited we are. We've <laughs> waited a long time. <laughs> Thank you. We welcome you and your expertise. I just had a couple questions regarding costs because nowhere in the report is there any mention of costs. Now, if I go through everything and analyze, there is a reference from the public that the overall contract was around $178,000 for the crossing guards. And then there's a reference to the addition of adding the second 
guard was $19,570. So um, am I understanding that correct, that the addition that the city council approved and having this second crossing guard was less than $20,000. And then the other is there is no, we need to have in reference of looking at costs. When we look at some of the mitigation measures that are recommended, you know, some of those are pretty inexpensive. Trimming the, the landscaping, certainly we um, having to reconfigure the signal for left designated left hand turn reconfiguring should we want to do no right turns but obviously there's cost for a raised crosswalk do we have any ideas of what we're looking at in regards to some of those items from a cost standpoint so we could look at this also as a cost ratio of what it would cost the city like obviously if it's $19,000 right now to continue the second crossing guard that that would be a no now but then how much is it for these other things? Or do we think that it's warranted potentially to look at not just if we want the second crossing guard to continue, but a recommendation to do some of the other mitigation efforts that might be feasible to do um, within our current finances and with staffing, et cetera? Yeah, just so just to answer, <clears throat> excuse me, um, just to answer the, uh, the first part of the question on, on the cost of the crossing guard, yeah, I did read the comment that there was from the public that they estimated how much it would cost to get that second crossing guard. Um, but I believe that um, that crossing guard was coming out of the uh, police budget, right? Um, so it was a line item through um, their budget. So I don't have the um, the actual estimate or the cost of that second second crossing guard, but we could certainly get that information um, for that. And in that, should yeah. the, should the crossing guard continue the um, understanding would be it would be a continuation through the police budget. Correct. Well, if approved by city council. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And then, and just your comment about the um, the cost analysis that they weren't included in the um, in the study. I I agree with you. That's something that we can definitely talk to the uh, consultant about making a cost analysis on some of these uh, recommendations that they made. Thank you, Vice Chair Hughes. Um, yeah, I, what is the typical process with funding crossing guards in the city? Um, are they typically funded out of the police budget or is it the school district or some other fund? Um, you know, I apologize for keep jumping up. Uh, obviously, um, David was very- As uh, long as cordial. we get answers, yeah. I, don't, you know, I really he, don't care. He jumped into this midstream as we were already underway. So I right. appreciate um, that, but I'll, I'll help try to field cool. some of the background questions. So, um, Yes, uh, they are funded through the police department. Um, my understanding is that the school district is not involved in the funding or the selection or use of the crossing guards. That was a comment that was brought up. Anywhere in the city. Anywhere in the city. Yeah. Actually, that, that was a comment that was brought up um, during the council meeting mm -hmm. last fall. Um, I'm assuming, and that's for the public schools. So I'm, I think there are some, some of the private schools fund their own crossing guards. Mm -hmm. Um, but as far as the um, unified school district, I, I don't believe they're involved in it for the funding or the selection. Um, and then just ge in general about the cost, you know, that was an item that David actually brought up when we first started discussing this report that, yeah, it was missing that type of information. Obviously, it's something you need to know. Um, another reason we labeled a draft because we assume we have to get back that information. Um, you know, I know this will um, come up probably in our discussion, uh, but there's, there's, uh, there's multiple pathways for you know improvements in this area. We'll we'll talk about that. But as you know, you're very familiar with our project list. You understand there's overlays of other things that are coming down the pipe uh, long term in this area. Um, so as far as costs go, um, uh, there's plenty of opportunity for us to look at that in this evaluation and our other capital improvement program projects. Um, what I see the recommendation for increased police presence there's a is there a cost with increased police presence um in other words like how often does a police officer need to be out there to have for that to be effective you know is it twice a month you know or once a week um like what it, there's a i assume there's a cost to that right 
Um, there's absolutely a cost. I can't speak on behalf of the police, but what I'll offer just from my experience in the city is that, you know, um, you know, police presence, I think has to ebb and flow with need. And so I don't think that's something that can necessarily be, you know, committed at this particular intersection. I think it can increase as needed for a particular issue, but largely I think the city's perspective is that, um, we don't solely rely on police enforcement to solve a problem. We try to find, you know, whether it's a crossing guard or engineered improvements, that's what we try to do. So I, even though that's a recommendation, um, might, I don't know if it's a sustainable one. Right, yeah. I mean, there's a cost to having, you know, is the crossing guard a lot cheaper than having, you know, one of the South Pass police out there? Um, what, can you share any light on like what went into the, the decision around the collision data period? I noticed it's like the past five years and you probably know like school was out, you know, because of the COVID pandemic, as well as traffic volumes were lower. Um, knowing that they could have requested like 10 year data. Um, why did we use the past five years? I, I can, I don't know if you I to... don't have any uh, context of why exactly they just did a five year right. period. They didn't specifically right. address it in the analysis, but I did notice that as well. Yeah. It's a five-year period, you know, pandemic as yeah, well. Yeah, how long were the South years. Pasadena schools remote? A year? Two uh, years? Intended two years. Yeah, uh, and I agree with David. I don't think that there was an intention on how the how the period worked. I think it was just the consultant's um, right. initial perspective to look at a five-year span. Right, right. But, you know, two years of that five years, you know, kids were in South Pasadena, weren't walking to school. True. Um where are the raised crosswalks? I see raised crosswalks and but I didn't I didn't see where. I mean my I don't think they're feasible. I don't I don't know if they're feasible at that intersection. Was that is that where they're being recommended at that intersection? So, yeah, that was the recommendation. Uh, okay. to my knowledge, I don't think there is any raised um crosswalks at that location at this moment, but that's just a recommendation that they made. Okay. Yeah. Cool. And then I didn't see any discussion of the middle school. Do middle school students also use that crossing? Our understanding is that they do, um, but I, I don't think it was. Uh, I, I don't think the evaluation was based on you know the, the demographics. The yeah. Came yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm sure we have some more questions and comments, and um, we'll go back to um, Commissioner Fisher. Okay. Thank you. Um, I can't believe that the consultant would propose a raised crosswalk at the intersection. Um, it would interfere with your detection there. Uh, it might surprise someone. Car might go, you know, uh, out of um, out of their normal path. We wouldn't want that. So I think the important thing at a signalized intersection is to make sure you can see the signal heads to know if they're red or green or not. And by raising up the pedestrian four inches, I, I'm not sure how helpful that would be. So I'm surprised at that one. Uh, we had the discussion of uh, increased police presence. And I realize uh, throughout most uh, jurisdictions, uh, there's um, a high vacancy rate for police officers right now. But Huntington Drive does have uh, radar enforcement. And I imagine there's some schedule that the police department has for going out there and uh, enforcing by radar. Um, and given that uh, Huntington Drive is the widest street in the city and the city with the highest speed limit, um, it would, I think we should emphasize the uh, cycle and the schedule that the police department has in enforce, enforcing by radar, especially uh, during school hours. Um, I had some uh, recommendations just based on my casual observation there. Um, one of them is that uh, we just talked about police presence, that's enforcement. And um, we're talking about traffic control measures, but we often don't talk about education. And when I was with Los Angeles at the schools, we had a program for someone to give a presentation to the elementary school children about traffic and traffic safety. 
and they would have a little course they had on the playground there and they would have miniature traffic signs and they would emphasize what do you do at a traffic signal what does the walk mean what does the flashing mean what does the countdown mean etc and um, they would tell them about stop signs and such and uh, so while we talk about what we can do from a traffic control standpoint expecting that we can solve all problems i think it would be helpful if there were some money in the budget for education at the uh, three elementary schools that we have in the city. Um, again, there are instructors who do this type of work and education has to be part of the solution. Uh, also, when you have um, a crossing guard that can be helpful, especially to the younger pedestrians, sometimes they can become too reliant on them. And we need to teach pedestrians to press the button to wait for the walk and not to initiate their crossing on the um, flash and don't walk. So um, crossing guards are, are, are can be good, but it can um, also, you know, put too much reliance on them and learning what to do. Um, I think it would be helpful, and this would be one recommendation, to have countdown signals. There are eight ped heads there, and based on Google Earth, um, there's only one countdown that I could see. Um, countdowns have been required at traffic signals whenever there's a, a visiting or a project at the intersection for at least the last 14 years. And so it appears that Maybe we haven't had a project at that location, but I think it would be helpful to have the countdown signals. Um, I think it also would be helpful recommendation too to have accessible pedestrian signals. Uh, they're the ones where when uh, you hear a slow tick, 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 it means press the button to, if you wish to cross. And then when you hear the rapid tick, 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 that means walk sign is on. I think that helps to reinforce through um, a, a noise uh, sensor that, um, that it's time to cross. Um, I think also it's probably likely that the signal timing at that location has not been um, examined recently. Um, could be wrong, but uh, when I was with Culver City recently for a few years. Um, we had a signal system that we built and as part of that signal system, we reviewed every signal approach for signal timing. And we found that many were timed based on the old guidelines and not based on the new guidelines. For example, the old guidelines said, uh, you should time signals only to get halfway to the last moving lane and that could be a long distance between that halfway point and the curb. And so we had to adjust those. Um, also, we're designing for uh, slower pedestrians. Maybe children sometimes, exuberant children aren't slow, but that gives a little bit of cushion to, to time it at three and a half feet per second. Um, and then from a signal timing standpoint, uh, we now have in the California Vehicle Code and in our state's traffic manual, new guidelines for, um, for the yellow time to make sure that a motorist can get safely into and out of the intersection or can brake safely. Um, I bet maybe that hasn't been looked at for some years. And then now there are guidelines for all red which, uh, you know, you need to have an engineering approach and make sure that a vehicle can get through the intersection um, w with an all red. And so I think the signal timing just needs to be looked at. I, it ha probably hasn't been touched in years. That's, that's my uh, guess on that. Um, protected left turn. There was a recommendation for protected left turns on Marengo. And if you look at the turning paths for left turns, southbound Marengo versus uh, northbound Marengo, their paths cross. That's because Marengo is narrow and Huntington Drive is wide. So it results in that geometry. And um, 
it creates kind of a can create kind of a chaotic situation in the middle of the intersection when you have these paths that, that cross each other. So to correct that, you can put in a protected left turn for either the northbound or, or southbound movement. And it appears that the southbound movement is the uh, heavier movement of, of the two left turns. So definitely at least one of those approaches needs a protected left turn. Um, and then the um, other thing, which I think could be a possibility, but um, it's something to look at anyway. I, I don't feel strong about this, but uh, where you have higher speeds and more lanes, it's all, often helpful to have a an additional signal head on the mast arm. Now, on most of Huntington Drive, there's only one head over on the on the mast arm for the through traffic, and another head for the left turn. But I think uh, again, as speeds get higher, as the lanes become numerous, I think you can consider having an additional signal head if your accident data shows you that there are rear ends or you know you're having conflicts with either the pedestrians or the or the vehicles on uh, Marengo Avenue again I don't feel strong about that but I think the consultant needs to look at that so with that those are my comments thank you thank you commissioner fisher um chair i mean commissioner avelson i'm going to was once upon a time i mean <laughs> Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, there were a couple of questions I forgot to ask the first round, and then I'll dive into my comments. Um, so I talked about or asked about speed data. We don't have that. Then uh, the, the issue of visibility is discussed. I didn't see any site distance analysis or calculations here. Did you Did you see any or any performed? No. Okay. Um, The other thing I was wondering, um, it's either for, for uh, David, Ted, or members of the commission, I was wondering how common it is to have crossing guards at signalized intersections. Um, it seems like most of the crossing guards in our town are at unprotected or unsignalized intersections. Maybe they're always stops, maybe one leg is stop controlled. Um, I, I was, does anybody have any data or information about that? Because it, it seems that it would be uncommon to me, but I don't. That's just anecdotal. Yeah, I believe that the majority are unsignalized. As you mentioned, the ones that are on Marengo, I don't think are signalized. Um, and then I, I'm not sure there's not one over on Fremont. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm not sure, but I... This is probably the only one. Yeah, and it might state. be a function of the distance, but... Yeah, I think All right. you're correct. And, and just to confirm, we, we don't have any information as to why the first crossing guard was put there. No, okay. um, and I don't know how long it's been since that happened too, but we can probably try to find out that information. Okay. That might be helpful to know as far as uh, getting the bigger picture. Okay, and don't, don't go anywhere. I have one other question. <laughs> what was the cost of this report? And does it include updates and revisions and additional information and so forth or are we talking additional costs too sure um it's a good question because this was a very unique situation in which the consultant was very eager to do this work and we hadn't finalized our cost for it so um we we were expecting to spend a like five around like four to five thousand dollars for the evaluation because it didn't require um a a tremendous amount of data collection. The data collection was, as you saw from Switters, um, but our intention was to have two rounds of review, which was the draft report, um, commission, commission and city staff comments, and then a final report um, and recommendation to council. Okay, and so what, what is the number? So I, I don't have it yet because we didn't agree to it yet, to be honest. Um, and <laughs> I that, need to put you in a corner. Yeah, no, and, and that happens actually with some of the consultants. Some of them won't start until we have it signed. Some start right away and assume we'll figure it out. It's just, 
Yeah. So this is one of those. This so is one of the one spectrum of the situation. Okay. So it's yeah. fair to say it's north of five thousand. Yeah. Fair? We think it's about five thousand, probably a little bit more for this evaluation. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right. That's that's it for the questions. So um, I, I think my actions on this commission, the prior action, and the prior commission speak volumes in that I'm definitely somebody who is very eager to recommend changes when necessary to protect motorists, pedestrians, and so forth. Um, so I went into this looking, looking at the study to, to, to find, okay, so what are the issues? What are the problems? What did, what, did, what did the consultant find to be a problem at this intersection? The truth of the matter is I didn't see any. The only ones I found were the crossing guard should come earlier, which seems very valid, that um, motorists driving south on Marengo, uh, it's possible that they can lose patients um, wanting to turn left onto eastbound Huntington. Fair. Um, but the only data I, that, that we have here suggests that there are very few accidents, and I, I appreciate Chair Dunlap's comment that it's, typically when we look at these, it goes five years back, but COVID was certainly a unique situation, so maybe it makes sense to look further back to see if there were more. Um, but the fact that there's one pedestrian-involved accident over the past five years I, I, does not suggest to me the need or the, or the justification for all of these recommendations. I mean, we, we've looked at other intersections and street segments in town, which have far greater demonstrated accident histories. Um, and they haven't been addressed. So it's, it's, it seems to me like it's, I, I certainly understand uh, pedestrian safety and child safety particularly, but it seems like if we're gonna re make recommendations, especially some of these more uh, significant, um, impactful ones that we would need something more on, on both the data front and um, in terms of consultant findings to support them. I don't, I don't see that here. Um, so I, I certainly don't see the basis for two crossing guards. I, I, I don't, I can't quibble with, with that conclusion. Um, the fact that there's one I think is terrific and it would seem that that would be sufficient. I haven't heard why two are needed. Um, uh, and, and, and if one's, covering one side of the intersection and one's covering the other, then maybe there needs to be some kind of direction for pedestrians to use one leg versus the other. We've certainly done that at certain locations. Um, with regard to visibility, when there isn't anything here that, that, dem that shows us what the visibility issue is, but assuming there is one, it would seem to me that obviously if, if there's a landscaping uh, issue that, that can be addressed through trimming or otherwise, um, the other, uh, the other item, which is actually, it's not one of the recommendations, is perhaps uh, extending red zone at key locations at this intersection. If there are certain legs or directions that are a problem for visibility, then maybe we can push the parking back a bit to extend the view. Um, but I don't know just from looking at this. Um, I really like the leading pedestrian interval suggestion. Um, we did that actually, actually the city of Pasadena did it with our support um, at the intersection of Orange Grove and Columbia a few years ago. There had been multiple injury accidents at that location. It was very interesting. It was westbound Columbia drivers turning left to go southbound on Orange Grove to get to the freeway. So similar left turns against a crosswalk and there were multiple, multiple injury accidents. Um, the city of Pasadena, which controls that intersection, installed the pedestrian lead interval. There hasn't been one since. Um, and, and I think that's a very, even though I don't see the data here, I think that's a great idea in terms of making the pedestrians more visible, increasing safety, um, which I think is a good idea no matter what. Um, the pedestrian countdown signal head, I'm not quite, it, it seems like that's also helpful for pedestrians and could improve safety. Um, it sounds like it's at one location, or corner, but not the others. So it would seem like that's something, I don't know how much hardware is involved in that change or if it's just programming, but it seems like hopefully that's not a large investment and maybe that's something that can help in terms of improving 
uh, pedestrian safety uh, as they're crossing the street. So those two made sense to me. Um, red zone, if it's appropriate, uh, extending red zone where needed makes sense to me. Um, when we start talking about uh, reducing green time for Huntington, I think that's a concern. It's a major arterial. Um, and so you're creating other issues when you start reducing the volume that can cross through the intersection on the major, on the major thoroughfare. Um, the left turn arrow, um, you know, we've recommended that in the past. Um, and it was, it was, it was motorist and pedestrian safety. Um, but we had data for that. I don't, I don't see it here. And again, when we talk about a left turn signal, that means reducing time for other directions and movements through the intersection. So that's something I think that has to be considered. And I don't know if the volumes justify a left turn signal. Um, I think maybe some, some pedestrian signage could be helpful in terms of making it clear when you can and can't cross or when you should or should not start crossing. Um, and I like the idea of education, but so those were the things that, that, that stuck out to me. Um, and, and this is part of a larger discussion, maybe next meeting, the meeting after when we talk about the other location on Huntington that's come up, you know, Huntington's a very wide street, right? And it's a 40 mile an hour speed limit. Um, the striping there is, I don't know how many decades old, um, that the travel lanes are pretty wide. Um, so one thing that can be also considered, considered in terms of maybe reducing the speeds on that street or narrowing the travel lanes to something closer to a minimum amount and providing edge lines. Um, and maybe by narrowing the travel lanes, you're gonna reduce speeds that can address part of these folks' concerns as well. So those were, those were some of my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Abelson. Um, Commissioner Hughes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a couple things. One was the um, comment that one of the public comment speakers referenced regarding the scramble configuration, because if we're looking at children that are that are crossing, it might make sense to consider because that way they're not going, they're doing one um, pathway diagonally to get to, depending on where they're going, which which would help for that, the, the child that's going Marengo and then having to cross and go west. If we've got scramble potentials there, because when they go back at the end of the day, so that might help. Plus that would potentially help with the, um, make it a broader scope with the child safety and the crossing guards going between um, the north and south side of Huntington Drive. The other is the comment which I agree with, crossing the length of crossing, extending that so that there's more time to get across all the lanes of Huntington. Because I know that personally, I live on Huntington and have to cross that and it's like, Quick. I mean, it's about a 30 second. If I'm correct in the timing, and that is with the count, that's the countdown. And that's the Fletcher using that as an example. And that's tough. And if you're little and you have smaller legs, you want to cross your they're both gonna have they're gonna run out of the timing potentially. So I think if we could look at that, and I do agree with um, looking at the right, the left-hand turn designated lanes. I do think one of the issues also to look at when we look at the timing, we've had construction in the city of San Marino for probably 18 months to 24 months on Huntington, where they have taken away lanes as they've been doing street improvement. I think they're doing you know, utility improvement as well as the landscaping improvement that they're doing in the, on the median. So, what seems to be occurring a lot of times is you're, you're, you're reducing your traffic and you've been doing that for quite some time. You literally break out of that very close to our border and everybody then goes and speeds up. So I think we've been, in, we've been experiencing, which I think has been demonstrated in some of the traffic we've been complaints we've been hearing about, but I think we are experiencing that east, west speed increases because of the frustration 
of people being limited as they've been going through San Marino, they get to us and they go crazy. So I think it's something we need to keep in mind. And I don't know how it's affected when we get data, if they're going to go back and look at new speed data, but it's something to, to look at that we have that I think is occurring. I also think that the pandemic also caused people to increase their, their driving speed just because of the nature of they got the, the ones that were out there, they were driving, there wasn't a lot of traffic, and they got into the habit of increasing their speed. And I think that's still a habit that continues. Um, so those were just a, a few thoughts in regards to um, why they didn't look at the scramble. And I also want question why we didn't get speed data. And I also want to uh, comment that I, which I think one of my fellow commissioners or more than one mentioned was Huntington Drive needs to be looked at in its, in its, in a greater scope because one thing affects another. We know we've got a number of areas and I know the recommendation here potentially moving, some, eliminating potentially some crossing, but we have big stretches where there are no crossing. And then we start to get that speed um, increases there. And when you're going to the uh, west, the east part of, of town into Huntington, we have large areas there with um, just crosswalks with nothing, which I know we also have that part of the west and part of the west where there is, there's no signal, there's no stop. It is just a crosswalk for pedestrians, particularly the one over going through the curve near the liquor store. That's very dangerous because the lighting is not good and you're crossing again the, all of the lanes and the pedestrian. I mean, I've seen lots of near misses. So I think as we look at Huntington, we need to look at it in, it, in its totality um, for the city boundaries and also what we can do to improve the safety overall. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Hughes. Um, um, I have one more question. Did did anyone have a conversation with the existing crossing guard? Like, hey, you know, what's what? You know, you're here every day. What do you see? What challenges? Uh, no, we didn't. We did not. I know that was a comment from one of the public comments tonight, also about gathering additional data right. that might not necessarily be in Twitter's. Was from you know both police enforcement experiences, which might not be reported. And then also the crossing guards. Right. They probably seem like the most knowledgeable person as to what's going on at that intersection during school time than anyone up here. Um, and yeah, I, I guess echoing some thoughts um, from my fellow commissioners, yeah, some of the recommendations just left me scratching my head a little bit because there weren't really, um, there wasn't really data or, or to support it. I, I think some of the ones that are, very low cost and very systemic in nature are fine. You know, like um, if the crosswalks are faded, maybe we should restripe them. Although I don't see that on here. Um, leading pedestrian intervals, pretty non-controversial, you know, something that you can easily do. Um, looking at the, the visibility, the red curb, um, which, um, which um, Commissioner Abelson brought up. Um, Commissioner um, Fisher brought up some, some ideas around um, looking at the signal timing, the red, yellow time, um, making signal timing adjustments. Um, I, I, I concur that as far as left turn phasing goes with the offset at the intersection, that you're really not gonna be able to, it's really not feasible, you know? And I think that's kind of what left me scratching my head is, um, you know, why would you put in an engineering report something without really looking at the feasibility of it or do an engineering report recommending something that says, Oh, if it needs, if it's not warranted, right? Um, and in, in, in addition, protected left turn phasing would delay delays pedestrians crossing the street. You also have the class two bike lane there. I used to ride my bike there to and from work every day, and um, you have to wait on your bike a while to cross the street. And and yeah, I, I you know if you're going to do a left turn arrow, maybe it's a flashing yellow arrow, arrow where it's just protected during this, if you can move things, where it's just protected during the school times and then it's permissive um, the other times of the day. Um, let's see. Um, eliminating the crosswalk, I think I'm not supportive of that, like reducing the walkability of 
of our community. That's really something that we all um, value. I don't know how my fellow commissioners feel um, about that crosswalk removal, um, but you do, that is kind of a, it's such a, um, you know, it's such an active street Marengo and people walk and cross the street there a lot. Um, there are two bus stops on Caddy Corner sides. Um, sometimes when you remove the crosswalk and you have a bus stop, you need to move the bus stop because, you know, when the bus only comes every 45 minutes and the bus is there, you're going to risk your life getting to that bus on time rather than, um, you know, missing the bus. So um, a lot, a lot of outreach and a lot of just thought that I feel hasn't been fully vetted, um, you know, has, I, I guess I, I don't understand some of the data behind that. So um, as far as the, the intersection goes, as someone who used to bike through that um, every day, it's confusing. It's, well, there are a lot of people turning. It's a big cut through, as, as you probably know, um, because it's a lot quicker to go up Marengo instead of up Fremont. Um, you have a number of turning vehicles because um, people um, from, um, Alhambra heading north, they'll go either cut up Marengo or they'll cut up Fletcher and make a right turn on Huntington to hit Sierra Madre and head up into Altadena or Pasadena. So you know, there's a lot going on, um, you know, because of the turning movement, because Huntington is such a wide intersection. Um, I would, I'm certainly supportive of the second crossing guard remaining until, um, you know, safety measures can be implemented. Um, I probably, Definitely, or I'm supportive of even that continuing. It sounds like it's a relatively low cost and um, compared to infrastructure um, that takes years and it's very expensive. It's also a good paying job um, for a retiree or, or someone, a good part-time job um, that helps, you know, have, some, have someone be active in our community. And like, um, so I think you get a return on investment and it's, it improves the well-being and livability of of south pass so um those are the, those are my comments i i hope um that kind of provides some guidance and input to you um as far as like next steps go would you like um a recommendation on on continuing the crossing guard or or removing one or um it could be however you see fit i mean i think um our general sense is that there's likely your recommendation is related to revisiting some of the aspects of the report and, and taking some additional consideration given your, all your comments tonight. It sounds like probably the direction you're pushing, you're, uh, you know, guiding us towards. Okay. And as far as the existing crossing guard, the second crossing guard, that crossing guard would remain. Sure. So, um, you know, uh, I think that um, as far as that recommendation goes, uh, I think we have to revisit this. So um, we, our initial plan was not necessarily to come back to the commission about this. We were going to gather your feedback, um, whether it was a combination of, you know, updates to the report and or, you know, thoughts on the crossing guard and gather that and just basically present it to council. As you know, this was an item that the council requested that we take up. So we're really just trying to gather information and gather expert advice and then provide it back to the council for their decision. Um, so if you, you know, have thoughts on a recommendation on the crossing guard, either way, we'll, we'll definitely take that um, with us. So, you know, when we go back to the council, we'll tell the story. We'll basically say we brought a draft report. There was a lot of, you know, uh, meaningful feedback from the commission. We reevaluated the report, um, but in addition to you know the public comments and the commissioner's thoughts, you know this was the feeling on the crossing guard. So, however you want to arrange right, this, we're right. basically facilitating this. I'll turn it over to Commissioner Hughes, but for, first, I'm I mean I'd be comfortable making a motion to continue a second crossing guard. I, I'm not sure if I have support from. No, I just had a question about the the uh, funding. So right now, the crossing guard would be in this fiscal year's budget that we would be concluding June 30th. And then do we know whether the second crossing guard is currently planned in the budget for the next fiscal year, July 1, so the crossing guard would start with the school year? 
So has it been allocated? So if it was like, we're not going to go forward, that would be a savings or has the money not been allocated based on a recommendation of need, whether they wanted the second guard, the second crossing guard to continue? My understanding is that the budget has stayed the same so that it's allocated, but my, our, my interpretation of the council's of direction was that um, that we return before the school year starts to council so they can make a determination whether they you know should can reallocate that money somewhere else. But as our budget process works, we basically carry over the exact the same operations budget unless we make a decision to add or remove and we, that decision hasn't been made hasn't been made yet. So it's not a it's not a crunch per se. So there's opportunity for you to gather some of the data that might be more um, supportive. The questions that were that came up about data and going back to the consultant or is that is that, am I understanding that's still feasible? As yeah, as that, that's our plan is to you know finish up this process so we can be making a recommendation you know early summer to council for them to decide what to do. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. But just point of order, the recommendation is to evaluate the report and um, and provide input and recommendations on the draft findings. We're, we're not being asked to comment on whether there should be a second crossing guard or not, right? We're just being asked to comment on the report. Is, is that correct? Um, you can. We're asking basically for input and recommendations on the draft findings and <laughs> if you choose to further recommendation to council on next actions. Those next actions could be, you know, give it another year, you know, keep the crossing guard, you know, um, add the infrastructure improvements and maintain the crossing guard. Um, again, as you are the advisory body, we're not asking anything really specific of you. We're asking you to advise uh, both us and the council. Wilson? Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, just a couple of questions. So the second crossing guard, that city council approved last fall for any study or evaluation was done. That's already, they are continuing through the end of the school, this school year, early June, whatever that is, right? That's done. Yes, that's So we're done. just talking about Next subsequent year. years. Yep. Okay. Um, is, there, is there an opportunity, I'm trying to separate my opinions from this question. Um, for staff to, sorry, I keep looking at Ted. I it's okay. apologize. Yeah. It's habit. Um, for uh, staff to follow up with the consultant uh, with regard to our comments, recommendations, thoughts, and to come back to us with the consultant's revised report, or there really won't be that opportunity. Because my thought is, if there is, that's better than I think you're taking everything we've just said, go to the consultant, the consultant makes some rev revision, and then just go straight to council. I don't, but sure. Yeah, there's always that opportunity, of course, for us to do it that way. That that's no problem. That you know, if that that works for you, that might be a better, better for the for us for the community. And I think for council to get better direction from us based on whatever the consultant's final report is. Sure. Just yeah. Just once considering all the feedback. Right. Another comment, if you don't mind, I think to be realistic, anything that this commission might recommend, whether it's um, accessible pedestrian signals or countdown signals or retiming, will not be done by the next school year. No matter how much we want to do them, they probably won't be done because of, you know, the way the city processes work. So I would think while we might make recommendations that might be funded in a following year, uh, they're not going to be completed by August. Is that correct? So what I would add is like that's very that's correct. I think that if we're talking larger infrastructure improvements, and I alluded to this earlier, if we're making signal adjustments and things like that, that's something that we would want to handle with existing funding. The most obvious answer is the Fremont Heinton project that we are in the planning phase for right now. There is an opportunity to do things like, you know, um, you know, removing a crosswalk, removing a bush. We certainly can't move a signal controller cabinet um, before the school year. So there's there's an opportunity to do short term things, whether that's in combination of keeping a crossing guard or in lieu of. That's the type of thing that we'd be able to accomplish before the um, 
school year. But, uh, you know, again, I don't know if the council uh, had an intention of the scope of the recommendation at the time of whether it would be something major or something simple. Um, so, but your comments are, you know, well placed in the fact that, yeah, if there's, if it, there's a large engineering solution that we, that won't be in place before the school year starts. And it might be helpful to break apart the engineering solution into things that like quick build things that can be done, you know, relative, like short term and then longer term things that, you know, you have the Huntington Fremont active transportation project, you know, considerations that should be factored in, into that project um, that might be more just like nice to haves um, when, you know, when you're developing that project or scoping it out. But I, I think Commissioner Fisher makes a good point that infrastructure enhancements are not going to be done before the next school year. Um, I mean, we kind of went through the project list and, you know, some of the retimings had been on the list for for months and, you know, we're, we're four months away from the new school year. Um, so, you know, I would be willing to move. I'm not sure where everyone's at, you know, um, if funding allows um, in, in city council views that um, permits of funding that that crossing guard services or second crossing guard service continues um, at the intersection of Huntington and um, Marengo Avenue for the next school year. That'd be the 2023-2024 school year. But it sounds like I don't have a second, so the motion fails. No, I, I would second that, and I think what would be helpful is to the point of, of uh, Commissioner Abelson is that I think being able to come back with more information if possible, but then to be able to say, here's our step one. Step one, these are the... I'm going to call it the simple things to do, such as we will look at the landscaping. Two, we'll look at the red the red zones around the uh, for the turning. We'll look at um, what we can do for an educational component with the school district that won't cost us, or maybe that could be provided very inexpensively, and then have the second crossing guard so that we have those safety elements in place, knowing that these other longer term might be for the next year, the next two years, but potentially we might get to a place where, yes, you don't need the second crossing guard because you, you have dealt with this issue with these other actions and other resources. Commissioner Abelson. Thank you, Commissioner Fisher. <laughs> um, so before us, we have a, a, a report, an analysis, a study that says that the second crossing guard isn't necessary. We have the, the fact that the second crossing guard was put in pursuant to public comment without any evidentiary or data support for it. It was done, from what I can tell, for political reasons. It wasn't done based on data. I don't see the basis for it. We have a report that says it isn't warranted um, based on what we have before us. And it would seem to me that um, there are, if, if, if there is this desire to have protection on both sides, maybe there's a different, uh, which I don't see here, um, that maybe the suggestion is that, that the, sc the, the, the school children use the leg of the street that crosses Huntington, which is the most um, important crossing there, um, where the guard is. So if there's a guard only on the east side, for example, then that's the crossing that they should use to cross Huntington. Um, from south to north, uh, instead of providing guards on each side, um, I, I just from a logical perspective, I don't, uh, I don't see it, and and based on what's before us, I don't see it. So, it would be hard for me to support that without something justifying it. Thank you. Just one, just a kind of an addition. Sure the only thing that would feel like I could, might disagree a bit is one. The data that we have is only five years and it's skewed because it was during pandemic and it doesn't reflect um, possibly the real attendance or crossing that might have been historical or greater because of the anomaly of the pandemic numbers. We also don't have the speed data and we already know that we've had a lot of references to speeding including the recent accident. 
Um, so I just feel like there's, there's a safety in children that just keeps pounding in my head. And for the amount of money, is it worth it? If you say there's not a lot here, but they also, I don't think, provided everything and gave us everything. And we only have five years worth of data for accidents, not 10. And the numbers we have also are skewed because of the pandemic. So I just worry that the protection of children is so critical that it might be worth moving to support having that expenditure as we get more data, as we get more, and as we look at long term mitigation solutions so it could be phased out, potentially. So that's just kind of foundationally my mindset. Commissioner Fisher. Yeah, since the uh, council um, approved the second crossing guard as part of a political process and then handed it to us where we have many signatures from children, I would recommend that we discuss the report but not the issue of the crossing guard. I think that will remain a political process. But I would like to try a motion to see if we can agree. Um, it would be that we recommend that the consultant um, revise his report to reflect um, recommendations that have quantifiable data, data to justify them. And two, that we recommend that the consultant uh, consider recommendations from the MUTCD with regard to countdown signals, accessible pedestrian signals, and retiming of the uh, signal to reflect uh, modern practices with regard to pedestrian timing, yellow timing, and all red timing. And then, what is this, three? I have to three, I've yes. lost count. And three, that uh, we recommend that the consultant consider a protected left turn for either northbound or the southbound movement if it can be shown that their uh, paths uh, interlock with each other. Is that okay, Eric? <laughs> The the left turn signal, yeah, the left turn phase, cause, yeah, because they they interlock with each other, they they conflict with each other. Yeah, I I I just wonder about the you know, the cycle links and the, as well as the, um, I mean, you know, a non non peak times, you know, right? But but you've got you know an adjacent intersection at um, Huntington and Fremont has left turn phases, so. You know, there certainly wouldn't be any less. Can I massage time. your third item with a friendly amendment that you may not receive as friendly? Certainly. Uh, <laughs> and we're also not dealing with Eric's issue, but and, and, uh, uh, and that is that you know we have what a dozen recommendations here. It's sort of like this potpourri of. So my thought was that maybe the consultant, as part of this re revision process come back with a more a, a narrower list of data supported recommendations whatever they happen to be whether it's what you just said or some of the other things we discussed is that is that fair yeah i, I think that would be a, a, a an improved way of of, of saying that, that that the consultant consider the following recommendations with what the data supported Right, with a smaller set of recommendations. Right, the ones that are actually data driven, because it seems like, and I'm not, this is a speaking amendment. I'm sorry, but that it seems like a lot of the recommendations were a reaction to a sense of the need to make them based on some comments made by the public versus being data driven. So, my thought was that maybe he, uh, the consultant comes back with a, a shorter list of targeted re recommendations based on data. Yeah, I think adding the words a smaller set of yeah. recommendations would, would be helpful. Thank you, Commissioner Fisher. Um, as far as what, can, the, that's my I'll motion, is there a oh, that's your motion? I'll second yeah. it. Okay. Okay. So the motion is that the consultant come back to us with a narrower set of, could to take all the comments in today. Sorry not to restate your motion, but to take everyone's feedback in today and, um, 
you We're, come back with data driven and there right data supported and then i had the um the mutcd recommendations for uh, signal timing countdown signals accessible pedestrian signals yeah. and i would add to the clarification for data that one would hope that they were looking at a broader scope of data all of the 10 years versus five years and some other data that they could bring into the the equation correct that would be the assumption for data that they is there a standard like if if sorry it's okay if if, 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 if it's if five years is typically how the look back period and we're agreeing that two years of those five years were covid influenced then they would need to go back seven i guess but i don't know i leave that to the experts I well i did maybe eric has different experience but my experience has been um when you're trying to see if a pattern is met you might extend it a few years because that might be helpful if you have only one collision subject to remediation um it's not likely that adding the additional two years or five years are going to give you that pattern and besides it would be on the front end of that period and not more recent but but i would say it's so e it's very easy to get traffic collision data from it's very easy to get a sweaters report okay. that it shouldn't be if i were an engineer signing this report like i would want all the information available to me and knowing how easy that is to get okay it's like I w it wouldn't hurt to get it okay that, that that's true so i would amend my uh motion to add that uh the consultant obtained tenure collision information, but we need a second on that. That's second. That's okay. Fine. All right. Um, and we've made so uh, many changes, of, Leona. If you don't uh, get it, you, you it's, know on, where to it's get on it. YouTube. Um, <laughs> so, so all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Motion carries four zero one absent. Now, I would like to go as far as the next school year, because I, I made a motion that we continue or that the city continue or council consider continuing crossing guards for a second year um, if funding is identified um, at the intersection. Is there any second on that? I'll second that. Can you restate it that we recommend that, that the council? The council that council consider well, we recommend council ex extend extend the contract for a second crossing guard at Huntington Marengo um, for the 2023-2024 school year. So that's the upcoming school year um, if funding is identified. Okay, so the consultant has recommended no continuation of the crossing guard we're recommending then continuation of the crossing. We're, we're recommending the continuation of a second crossing guard and i'm seconding because my my philosophy is that it's going to take us a while to get this report done and they've already budgeted for it and it, it'll give us into the next year school into the next school year to take the remedial actions that we need to take get the report get the report to council all of that so Potentially, if we feel it won't be necessary for the 24-25 school year, we might it might not need a crossing guard. And that would be money saved. And because of all these other actions will have been put into place. And one of my justifications for it, and maybe I'm using the MUTC, California MUTCD liberally, but one of the minimum requirements of a crossing guard is the ability to recognize potentially dangerous traffic situations and warn and manage students in sufficient time to avoid injury. And I think because of the nature of that large intersection, um, you, you certainly can't hear students across the street. You can't warn students across the street. Um, there, there's a lot going on. There's a high turning volume. There's a high vehicular volume, both on Marengo as well as Huntington. And an extra set of eyes there, in particular because it's such a a major thoroughfare through the city. Um, I, I wouldn't be recommending a second crossing guard at Oak and Moringo, Oak and Moringo, but I think because of the the geometrics that that intersection, because it's so wide and it's and it's um, such a high volume, 
that it's unreasonable to, to expect that one person be able to recognize the dangers at that intersection and, and warn the students um, sufficiently, so. Well, with, and I second that, and also the other thing you have to, and I, a part of your, your rationale, I think, is important, because when you, if you're on that street and you're wait, sitting there, at the, particularly for children, if you have trucks going through, if you have the buses going through, you're not gonna hear someone on the other side of the street if there's the guard warning you about something and you're on the opposite side, that you, you're not gonna hear them. Right, so. Um, so Eric, under your motion, would it be to recommend for the additional fiscal year or to recommend it for one more year only? Um, wh one more year only, one more year. The 23 to 24 20, school The upcoming year. school year. Isn't that the same thing? It is. Well, no, to, to say the 23-24 fiscal year just means continuing at some point, the continuation becomes a, a permanent feature. So is the feeling that we want to replace it with traffic controls someday, or we want to continue it indefinitely? Because you outline, you right. just outlined reasons where we, why we'd want to continue it indefinitely. Yeah, I, I mean, I would be comfortable continuing it indefinitely, but I think at minimum until the traffic controls. I think if we at least put it for one year, it gives us the cushion period to see about the report, getting other recommendations, getting the budgeting in place to take other actions, even if they're the simple ones of the red, the red um, painting uh, near the. Um, intersection as you would current to give more site area um, to look at and get the more data all of that and then as you go into the budgeting for the 24 25 year they could say we don't need it and we're not going to budget for it there's nothing to say that we can't reduce doesn't mean if he might say that we want to continue it continuously but that doesn't mean that it can't be revisited and say no we don't need it We've taken these other actions. We're going to take a year, only have one crossing guard, and analyze how that goes and use that 19,000 or whatever the number is elsewhere. Well, I, I understand the motion, and um, my initial thinking was not to comment on the crossing guard because that was a political decision, not a objective evaluation or a decision based on objective evaluation and data and study yeah. it, it was political so i i just was reluctant to step into the political arena yeah it's a, yeah it sounds like because it was originally based on a on a decision by council and there wasn't that initial report um you know you know the it would be up to council to continue it. Um, I lost my but, but I, well, I think that, <laughs> I think the issue is that the, it was done without a foundational mm -hmm. database, but it's in place. It has been in place, and the community seems to value it. We've been analyzing it, but maybe we need to get additional data to help uh, do with more of the justification. But in the interim, as we deal with it, we're going to be. I think it's difficult to then to just stop it. Right. I, I yeah. And without making sure that certain other things have taken place, other mitigations, other other remedies, et cetera. So I think we need to give ourselves and the community has has is showing support for it. Mm -hmm. We need to then give ourselves time to pull in all the data, take uh, mitigation actions, and then potentially down the line, then it could be reduced and eliminated. Okay. And and outside understanding that. You know, it sounds like this will need to go before council in the summer, and this report will probably not have time to be revised and come back to the commission before that that council meeting. You know, I think we should provide at least a recommendation. You know, the biggest question is going to be, should we consider continuing a second crossing guard there? And I think it's important that we at least provide some guidance. Can I address that? that? Yeah. So um, you could certainly call the vote. Right. You made the motion of a second, but. I would say, it's to, to Commissioner Fisher's point, 
I'm uncomfortable. It, it, this is, at this point, it's political because we don't have data. We have public comment. So that's information and that's helpful information. But we don't have anything to support recommending a second crossing guard. I haven't seen it. So I don't know how we can say do it. Um, to me, the default is we don't do it unless there's evidence to support the need for it. If it was a political decision in the first place, then it's a, it seems to me it's a political decision as to whether to continue it. But I don't know how we make a recommendation to continue a crossing guard when we have a report that says it's not justified, right? And we have concerns about these measures that are recommended and the need for further data to support them. So I, I'm just uncomfortable making a, a decision like that when it's really not ours to make based on the fact that, I mean, if someone puts a gun to my head and said, should we have one? There may be political reasons to do it, but there's no scientific or engineering reason to do it that I've seen. And I, I would say, if, if I saw anything here, if there are any issues at all, they seem to be more, or the concerns seem to be more focused on the East leg than the West leg, the, the, the community concerns, not the data-driven issues, which aren't here. So what I would say is that if if that's where the where the problems are perceived, then maybe maybe another thing to think about again for council or we can uh, is that maybe the, the the one crossing guard that has been there historically, but for this year, um, is relocated from the western leg to the eastern leg. If that's where the concerns are, not to just double up when we don't have a basis for it. So that's sort of where I'm coming from. My, to counter that, my only concern is that the data I feel might not be as accurate because of the way it was pulled in the years it was it's covering. Well, but it went of the pandemic. I'm sorry. So that would be my. But it went back five years. But then I think. So if where is the data to support it in the first place? There isn't any, right? So it was a political decision. So so there may be further information that we could gather, right? Going back another five years, it's from John's comments. It sounds like it's unlikely, but if even if there is then that would be the time to say, okay, maybe we talk about these things, but we don't have it. So anyway, sorry, I didn't mean to. No, no, no it's, I just feel that maybe we, we should explore, but again, I, I worry that we just, even though the data is not there, I, I question the, the full scope of the report. It could, have, it could have been meatier. I think we all agree that there's, there's some gaps, some holes. And that we could definitely revise it. I guess one of the things you asked Ted and David is, how fast do you think we, a, a revised report could come back, so that we could hold off the the recommendation right now and going with the second, hold that. If we could, if you could come back to us in May, or the June meeting at the latest, so that the council then has opportunity potentially. Because one would assume it's already in the budget. So the question really becomes the question of the hiring or the continuation of that second guard for employment through the police department's contract. Um, so, you know, we can have this probably back to you. Um, we could probably look at this at, by June or July if we move on it, um, you know, right away. I think that. Um, I, I don't know that you would, I, I, I don't think you should necessarily determine whether you'd like to re-review it based on the timing to council. I think, you know, the value of your recommendation based on, you know, if you have enough information to make the decision should be sort of apart from the timing. We can work on the timing. You know, it's not like it's set in stone about how this works through the entire fiscal year. I think we can be flexible with it. So if you'd like this to come back, I think that that's what we focus on. Um, and then we focus on making the revisions to um, uh, get the report in such a state that you're you know, um, comfortable making a recommendation to council. Because Ted, one of the things that was so important, I think that was here is to get the feedback from the crossing guards. Because that's a gap we don't have. Like, if, if the crossing guard said, you know, we're kind of duplicating our efforts here, you know, maybe we don't, not that they don't want to have their jobs, but you know, they could kind of say, there might be another place I could be better utilized in a location. I, 
I don't know. I don't know what they're going to say. But they could say, oh, my God, it's made such a great difference to have the second guard here. Because I don't know. So I'd be curious to get that feedback. All right. Chair Fisher, and then we'll, we'll call a vote. Okay. Um, not Chair. Yeah. Commissioner Fisher. <laughs> Old habits. Um, right. Ted, isn't the budget adopted around the 1st of June for the coming fiscal year? Yes, it's budgeted around the 1st of June. So if I'm, you know, but um, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to be um, admonished by finance by saying this, but, you know, the, the budget's a living document. And so even if we're planning for the crossing guard to be in the budget, um, that can change into the, fis into the fiscal year. I understood. Um, but with regard to the motion at hand, your recommendation says to come back to staff with recommendations for an updated study. And so I don't know the pathway to get to the city council with a recommendation to budget for the crossing guard. It would be too late. And we have no path to report back to the council. The, the council is not going to get our recommendation on this. I'm pretty certain of that. Right? What we could do is, um, you know, if the concern is how it will be handled administratively by the city in the interim, you know, as staff, we can discuss that with finance and PD and see how, uh, you know, what the options are in terms of like, Okay, we have this scenario. It's unclear which direction we want to go because we need more input. Um, how do we want to handle it as we approach the this as we approach the school year? Um, and then we can always come back, you know, under a scenario. I don't I don't think it's fair to put the pressure on the commission to make a decision um, based on the budget circumstance. I think you know this is a important issue that the council right, right. wants to look at. The council has not asked us to comment on this you mean as far as the um well, you've asked us to report back to staff on uh review on the review of the report right sure i mean it says right here and recommendations to staff related to the draft findings well so again what i'll what i'll go back to is just like any other uh, i don't want to say it's a complex issue but an issue with a lot of factors uh as the facilitator of this discussion with council, we're really collecting all of your ideas and your thoughts. Um, we've got our consultant, we have our staff assessment. Um, we'll bring all of that to the council, regardless of whether you want to review it again and say like, this is what was discussed. These are the points of view. And so like that, that in itself has value from this commission. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to, you have to decide what to do and then what that's what we're going to tell council. I think the discussion, the input from the count, the the community, the consultant recommendations, these are all um, information for the council to deliberate and then decide what to do. Okay, thank you. All right, so um, my motion's still on the table. Um, Commissioner Hughes, second. Um, I guess um, all in favor? Um, aye. All opposed? All right, motion fails, 2-2. Yeah. All right, thank you, everyone. Um, thank you, David, and thank you, Chad. We appreciate this update and, and hanging out um, with us tonight and hanging in with us and reviewing this report. <laughs> um, our next agenda item is agenda item four, approval of minutes of the regular mobility and transportation, and transportation infrastructure commission meeting. Um, I know, thank you, um, Commissioner Hughes, for preparing them or, or, or Leona from preparing them and um, Commissioner Hughes for providing your comments and inputs has assume everyone's had a chance to review them does anyone have any changes or corrections looks like Commissioner Abelson Chair Dunlap so I, I just I was I thought the draft that was included in the packet was great except for there was one part regarding some comments by Chair Fisher but I think those were cleaned up by Chair Fisher in a red line that was distributed or a, a revised version that was distributed before tonight. So that's fine. And the only thing I didn't see were, uh, Mr. Chair, your comments. Did you have comments as well? I, I work with Liana on them. 
He yeah. did. He did. Yeah. He put in his. And they're here. Yes. They oh, are. okay. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah. No. Um, I think probably the first time ever I don't have any any revisions. <laughs> All right, Commissioner Fisher. Looks like you have a couple. I had a couple, and um, and these were the ones that I had commented on before. But I, I think in trying to collate all the comments, there may be a word missing here or there. On um, public comment general number one, under Mary Hoban, um, the second sentence. Oh, I'm sorry, fourth line of her comment. Um, where, it's, where it says, often the placement of trash bins, and I think the words should be added that say, in the street, at least that was my understanding of it. And on the, um, and on the second line, I'm sorry, on the second line, where it says, safety issues associated with entering and exiting the garage, and, and then I think the word and should be added and requested that measures be undertaken, blah, blah, blah. Um, on Sally Kilby, I think on the, uh, on the second line where it says uh, issues associated with Uh, the entering and exiting the garage, I just added, I took the word the and substituted vehicles with vehicles entering and exiting the garage. Other than that, those were my only additional changes. Thank you, Commissioner Fisher. All right, seeing that no one else has any other comments. Um... I would move that we approve the amended minutes. All right. Second. All right. Commissioner um, Abelson seconds. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The minutes have been unanimous, unanimously approved. Um, that brings us to our next item, item five, City Council Liaison Communications. We're joined by um, Councilman um, Jack <laughs> Donovan. <laughs> okay. Doing some tech work on the mic over there. All right. Okay, I'm on. Um, it's going to be short and sweet. I really don't have any comments uh, about the council or as a liaison. Uh, we have not had a council meeting since the last time we met here, okay, which is extremely unusual, but that's the way it worked with the uh, uh, school break. So I don't really have any comments. It's been an interesting discussion tonight. And it was pretty hard to keep my mouth shut over here. <laughs> uh, well, this, there'll be a lot more discussion on that. That's what I can tell you right, right, right now. Um, and that, that's it. Uh, and I think we have a meeting together on the 26th. We do. I think Ted will cover that during his, okay. his update. Okay, that's all I have for tonight. Thank great, you. great. And I hope you've enjoyed your Wednesday nights without a council meeting over the past couple of weeks. It was a vacation that truly was, <laughs> was deserved. Uh, everybody, all council members enjoy it. We, uh, Harmony is overworking us. Mm -hmm. I realize this is being recorded, but, but, it's, <laughs> but it's true. And we're all working hard and uh, we needed a little break. All right, well, it, thanks. thank you for joining us tonight. Um, we'll move on to Commissioner Communications. Um, Commissioner Hughes, do you have anything? Um, just thank you, Ted, for always putting together the updated project list. It really has made uh, keeping track of things very uh, much more concise and helpful. Welcome again to David, and it's great to see Antenna as well. Thank you for what's been going on with water. Um, I, I did want to share that um, even though that there's been a lot of water, a lot of snowpack, um, the Eastern Sierra has reached its highest level of snowpack in recorded history, over 300% of average normal of, as of April 1, um, there is still concerns with groundwater throughout the state. So, you know, still being mindful of smart water use is always a good measure. And um, I wanted to concur with a comment that uh, uh, former Chair Fisher made at the last meeting 
about how great the city of South Pasadena rock sign looks coming into the city because of all the greenery and everything around it. So uh, it's something special. I hope our residents are enjoying seeing that. And uh, just to thank you for being responsive on, on all of our needs and to again, welcome and congratulate Chair Dunlap. Thank so you. thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Abelson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I echo virtually everything that Commissioner Hughes just said. Welcome to David and Ted. Thank you as always. Um, hopefully you're not going to run for the hills after tonight's meeting, David. Um, a couple quick notes. Uh, hopefully everyone here has received it. The, the city sent out, I think multiple times, an invitation to participate in a budget survey. Um, I filled mine out. Uh, and if, if you didn't receive the email, you can access it on the website. I think the deadline to submit your input is the 21st, which is rapidly approaching at six o'clock. So if you want to provide input on the budget through that measure, um, please do so um, before that date. Uh, second, I think a couple of weeks ago, there was a um, particularly unfortunate accident on Monterey Road involving one of our two motorcycle traffic officers, um, Jeff Holland, which was most unfortunate. He's been with the city for decades and um, uh, I, I hear he's recovering, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to be some time before he recovers. And I just wanted to implore everybody to please drive safely. Um, and uh, our, my best wishes, and I'm, I'm sure our best wishes to Officer Holland. A um, couple other quick things. Thank you to Liana for passing along to Caltrans our continuing concerns regarding potholes um, on the 110 freeway. Uh, it's both the northbound and southbound. The I think it's the number three lane closest to the, the right-hand side, uh, basically between the Orange Grove exit south to the Grand Avenue overpass and just beyond. Um, they did resurface part of it, but uh, the rest of it is still um, a bit of a challenge. So thank you to Liana for that. Um, I want to remind everybody uh, several months ago, you know, I know we have hotspots all over town, uh, residents of Orange Grove between El Centro and Monterey uh, broached me about concerns on that street. Uh, again, speeding, side swipes, et cetera. And they shared photos and videos and I passed them along to, to staff. I wanna just make sure that that's present in our mind because we haven't been able to do anything just yet about it, but um, it's a very heavily traveled segment of Orange Grove, basically between Monterey and the Gold Line and then uh, El Centro and, and uh, Mission. Um, and it's narrow, uh, and uh, there have been issues with speeding and, and residents who park their cars on the street getting hit. Um, so I, I want to make sure we just keep that in mind. Um, and then last, sort of as demonstrated by our challenge the discussion regarding the second crossing guard, that, and, I, and I'm glad that things are starting to change, but I want to sort of echo the concern uh, with, uh, or the, let me put it a different way, ask that when city council receives input from residents about traffic, pedestrian, these types of issues that they uh, recommend to staff to come to this commission to maybe hear it a little more thoroughly and come up with some potential solutions or recommendations. Because here what happened was city council in, instituted a remedy and staff went and did the, the report, but we didn't have any input. Um, until now. And it would be helpful, I think, <clears throat> as I think staff is doing with the other concern on Huntington Drive, that if staff can come to us and maybe get some thoughts at the front end, and then we do the study and then <clears throat> recommend measures to remedy a problem if it exists. So um, I just wanted to um, to mention that. Other than that, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Fisher. Uh, yes, with our uh, new person on board, uh, David Pena, I just wanted to publicly thank the staff that we've worked with for being so um, responsive and conscientious. For, exa for example, I asked Leona at the last minute for another copy of the report because I couldn't print mine out. She had it for me. I, I would meet with uh, Ted and 
he would meet with me at 5.30 sometimes, knowing he had to go to a council meeting afterwards. So it's just a very conscientious approach. And it's a good uh, climate you're stepping into, David. Hardworking climate, though. But uh, uh, the other thing uh, is um, Larry reminded me of um, Orange Grove between uh, Monterey Road and El Central. And on several occasions, we've mentioned a very easy solution there. I think probably to your predecessor, Ted, but uh, that would sometimes be on my morning or evening walks. And on that street on both sides, I've never seen more than eight cars parked. And that was on a Thursday um, farmer's market night. Um, over the weekend when I walked there, there were only two cars parked on both sides for that whole stretch, which shows that it would be very easy to shift parking to one side of the street and uh, allow two lanes of traffic to travel without conflict, running into each other in a head-on fashion or hitting a parked vehicle. Very easy solution would not cause a hardship to residents. I'm sure that there might be some initial concern about it, but uh, there's plenty of curb parking space available if they were to park on one side of the street, which would allow us to get two lanes on that 30 foot wide street. So that would just be a really easy solution, keeping your minds. Uh, with, with that, I have nothing else to report. Thank you, Commissioner Fisher. Um, the only item I have is just kind of a preview of um, hopefully next month's meeting is um, kind of thinking about the work plan and what it might look like for the upcoming um, I don't know what year this is, <laughs> fiscal year, commission year. Um, and so to the public listening, as well as like to the fellow, my fellow commissioners, um, we can start thinking about um, items that, you know, that we should be discussing um, on the commission and um, try to give Ted as much work as possible. Um, but with that, Ted, I'll turn it over to you. Um, Just one quick question on that. Do we need to put on our agenda for the next meeting, the annual report in preparation for the uh, Commission Congress. The Commission. Um, yes, a good question, and thank you, Chair Dunlap, for bringing it up. So uh, the format of the Commissioner Congress will be very similar to what it was last year, in which um, the Commission will be asked to do two slides, one to highlight um, annual accomplishments, not necessarily to um, go through the entire annual report, and then number two is to highlight, you know, several of the many work plan initiatives that are you know, expected for the coming year. So we don't necessarily have to adopt the annual plan by the Commissioner of Congress, but we certainly want, as um, Chair Dunlap has mentioned, to you know, consider items that will be on the work plan and consider items in the annual report so that we can do a, uh, you know, a brief presentation. I think it might have been, what, like three minutes or something last year with all the commissions. So it's a very brief overview. Um, but yeah, we can... Um, uh, I don't know if we want to agendize a discussion about it in May, but certainly start thinking about it. And then um, we can, uh, as staff, we can, you know, draft that up and then get your feedback. Thanks, Ed. Yeah, I think we'll definitely want to talk about the work plan. You know, it sounds like with the Commissioner's Congress, it's a little overkill to go in there with the full work plan for the year, but we can maybe talk through next month what to highlight. Um, and I'll turn it over to you for your staff. Um, thank you so much. Uh, not much to um, add. I'll just reiterate that uh, next week will be a special joint meeting between UMTEC and the council. Um, we've listed it here as starting time at 6.30. Uh, I've heard that it could be as early as 6, but we've already posted 6.30, so if that changes, we'll inform you. Um, but yeah, we'll uh, be uh, all streets, the entire meeting. We'll talk about master planning. We'll talk about street projects, um, other impacts. Uh, I know the commission did have some recommendations that we took into consideration that discussion. We're not going to be able to cover everything. So the scope is going to be uh, more so about the planning effort and going over what the transportation projects are and really going over what the street process we're envisioning will be. Um, but it is a discussion study session, so please, you know, feel free to, um, you know, contribute and add, and then that's uh, goes for the public as well for that meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Ted.
And Liana, do you have anything? All right. Chair, just a quick question. Ted, is in the plan for that, is are you going to list all the funding? You need to discuss all the funding sources so that the public understands that there's different pots of money going to certain things. Do they understand that? Yeah, we're going to attempt to go through that at probably a, a general level to not get too complicated. But yeah, we do want to talk about um, their various funding sources. And then that'll kind of roll into um, our budget discussions, which will just start mid-May. Uh, we have like a finance commission meeting and a special session to sort of break down that a little further as we go through the capital improvement program. And then is there a way to also make in, um, reference that we would be, I'm assuming, looking for um, Inflation Reduction Act money where, where we can achieve that? Yeah. There's that, a lot of funding in there that we might be able to um, garner some. Yeah, we do have part of our agenda to talk about uh, federal funding and our, our plan and how to tap into, into that. Thank you. Thank you. With sorry, <laughs> this is a very this quick. Are we making any decisions at next week's meeting, or it's just discussion? Um, the we have one item so far on the agenda, which is approving the pavement condition survey moving forward. Okay, and so that's a pretty straightforward item, and that's a council item, correct? Um, yeah, I mean it would be a cons council consent item. Um. I think that uh, it's largely just a discussion. There aren't any decisions we made, but we are going to be expect, you know, uh, expecting some feedback into our process, um, our prioritization of how we want to move forward with street projects in the future. Um, so yeah, there'll be plenty of opportunity for discussion, but there won't be a hard uh, yes or no on anything other than uh, perhaps one or two task orders that are streets associated just because we want to get them done and it's a good timing to not bring it to another council session that already has a packed agenda. So it's easy to bring it to the okay. session. So it's mostly high level process. Yeah, it's high level. And uh, the first part of it, we're really planning to be an education. Um, you all have the benefit of being very, very familiar with all this, um, but for the council members and the community at large, there's a lot of details about how this works, especially as we talk about condition surveying and, you know, what goes in the decision about you know trying to decide um, how we do a street and where we do a street and that kind of thing? Uh, we gotta you know bring everybody up to the same level in terms of basic understanding first. Great, thank you, Ted. All right, with that, I'll call the meeting adjourned at nine fourteen p.m. Thank you. Thanks so much. <laughs>